So first of all, happy Mothering Sunday to all the mothers in the house and anybody who is not a mother, but mothers and cares for other people. Um, today's event, of course, we said we're going to be taking a trip down memory lane. <laughs> so um, it should be fun, but I just want to go through the housekeeping um, events, the housekeeping first. So just to remind everyone that this is being recorded, you will have heard it saying it's being recorded. Um, and by joining, we're assuming your consent. The other thing to make sure is that your name is actually visible on the screen. If I'm seeing anything like iPhone and no name attached to it or S10 or any just list of numbers, I will move you into the waiting room. And I do this not to be a horrible moderator, but simply because we've had people who sometimes spam on um, um, on the Zoom, and I want to avoid that. While we have the speakers talking, please do make sure that you keep your audios on mute. Any questions that you have, please put in the chat box. The other thing I just want to remind you about is that the next Guyana Speaks will be on the 24th of April. Um, Sunday the 24th at three o'clock UK time and um, just to say that it's an event about Roy Heath and his book called The Murderer and the reason why we've chosen that as a theme for next month is because it's going to become a Penguin book and Penguin are publishing it in May 2022 so we want to celebrate that and Roy Heath's son um, also called Roy Heath will be doing a presentation. There'll be some readings from the book um, and possibly other guests. I haven't kind of finalized how I'm gonna be doing the event, but that's the shape of it so far. The other thing to say is that in the following month, April, May, we're going to be doing, um, there'll be a talk on Alice B. Singh. So I had thought we'd be doing that. Yeah, but you should have enough. But um, we're shifting that. Please make sure you're all on your mute, mute Audios are all on mute. Um, I'm just going to mute a few people. Hold on a second, because I don't want um, any noise. Uh, Doreen, Joseph, can I ask you to please mute? Make sure you've got your um, audio on mute. Okay, so um, moving on, I would just like to invite Rod, who of course everybody knows is the other half of the Guyana Speaks team. So um, Rod, would you please introduce the next guest? Absolutely. Um, welcome everybody. And I will uh, take, I take pleasure in introducing Ruthie Richards Levi Babalola. Um, she is a London, she's London born with Guyanese and Nigerian parentage. In Ruthie's professional career, she headed a project development company, buying land and building homes for sale and rental. And additionally, she worked at London's Gatwick Airport with British Airways as cabin crew, traveling to the Caribbean, Asia and Africa for almost 10 years. She's a mother of one and has a son by the name of Johnny. Um, Ruthie loves fashion, traveling, keeping fit, flower arranging, and she's also lived in South America, Europe, and Israel, and is fluent in Dutch and knows a smat smattering of Hebrew. She's authored the following books, 47 Palm Street, The Weary Weary Pepper at, Com at the Commonwealth Games, The African Prince of Battersea, and The Tooth Fairy. There, I, I, if there's any others, um, I'm sure Ruthie will mention it. But to quote her, she says that her style of writing is always based on facts, truth, and real life experiences. So without further ado, the floor is yours, Ruthie. Well, thank you very much for that lovely introduction. I really do appreciate that. Um, and I, I will just quickly show you a couple of the books. So you, this is the Weary Weary Peppers. And as you all know, the Weary Weary Pepper is uh, a lovely little capsium. Uh, and I was working in, I've also worked as a uh, diplomat for uh, Suriname and I was dealing with agriculture and that's why I wrote that little book. 
And this is another book that I've written as well. But today we're going to concentrate on this one, 47 Palm Street, which some of you already have. And um, I have done a PowerPoint, so I'd like to share that with you, if I may. I, I can share. Oh, you've got it. Great, you've got it. That's great. That's it. And um, just go through it, basically. Uh, 47 Palm Street is in Work and Rust in Guyana, in Georgetown, Guyana. Those of you who know Guyana or from Guyana, you'll know all about it. Um, and I can move on. I'm just going to spotlight you. So just want to make sure people can see you. Um, and and then we'll move my on. Actual, this is this is the name I use for 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 writing for writing these books but my name is actually Christine um and the book starts off in a strange way because it starts off with my great grandfather who actually came from abroad overseas and uh, he had tough times and he decided to leave his country which was then what you could call Russia, Prussia, that kind of area. And he, he came to England and he got a, got a job uh, on a ship uh, to come to the new country, the colonies. And he was, because he was white, he was offered the job as overseer on a place called uh, La Bonne Intention, which some of you may know, which means the good intentions. And he landed in better for wakting, which means better expectations. And he was lonely and he thought, my gosh, I'm lonely. I've got nobody here. There's nobody really white that wants to marry me, but I want to be part of these people. And he, that he, he decided to have a beauty contest and my great grandmother, my mother's mother uh, caught, um, won the contest and that's how they got married. And uh, she was called Queenie after that because she was the queen of the village. Um, I want to show you, and after that, they went on to have children, of course. Um, my great grand, my grandfather is John Augustus Richards, and he was the, the son of slave, of, of slaves. And when he got his manumission, of course, they got nothing. They came with nothing and they, they when they got their freedom, they actually got nothing except the clothes that they were standing up in and they had to work after that. He decided to go to Venezuela and he uh, heard that there was gold in the jungle and he was sleeping in the jungle one day and he could hear this bird saying, who are you, who are you? And he said, it's me, John. And he said it again and the bird said, who are you, who are you? And only later did he realize when the Indians came to rescue him and, and tell him actually you shouldn't be sleeping on, on the floor, you should be sleeping in a hammock. Uh, that was a who you bird. I don't know if any of you know that. Have you heard of this who you bird? Yeah, and, and so that, that was kind of a, a standing joke that he was, he was talking to a bird when, he, when there was no one there. Um, he, he actually got some gold and he came back to Guyana. He wanted to get married. And uh, somebody said, you know, if you want a wife, you have to first build a cage, you know, that build a house, something to attract her. And he bought this piece of land um, in, or this lot of land in number 47 Palm Street. And he, he built a very beautiful home made of, uh, of you know, uh, green heart wood. And somebody said about a sewing machine earlier, I think it was Joyce, that's the next, next slide. You're in charge of the slides, aren't you? Whoever's got, the next slide is shows, shows a sewing machine. And this sewing machine here is the engagement present he gave to my grandmother, Beatrice, because she was a seamstress. And with this, with this sewing machine, for the rest of her life, she would design dresses. She only had to look and see something in a, in a newspaper or a magazine and she could make it. And they were partners. He was a policeman. I, I don't think I've got a picture. I've got a picture of him in the book as a policeman. And he, he was uh, in a beautiful uniform, but later he, he got promoted and he became the, in charge of border market. And uh, he was able to, uh, one, of the, one of the few people there who would actually work as a controller, a director. And this is him in, that's one of the pictures from the book. 
hope you can see um, it. Just so that you know, we can't see it because I think you've got your background blurred. So it means that when you show us- Ah, okay, I don't know how, to, let me see if I can get rid of that for you. Um, well, I might, I might have to do that later, but it, it's one of the pictures in the book. Uh, I'll try and do that later for you. Um, I tell you what, tell me, tell me which um, which page number it's on, and I can show. Okay, them. sure. It's one seven six. One seven six. That's, oh gosh, I just dropped it. That's clever. One seven six. Here we go. And that's my grandfather in charge of Border Market, and you can see he's got. It was a very special photograph because uh, back in the days, not everybody had a phone and he had two phones on his desk and he was showing, yeah, look, I'm in charge here. I'm the one. He was also a, a member of the Freemasons uh, and he used to have the apron and he used to do business with the people there. Um, and he was in charge of many things and he did many things such as uh, uh, make a, make a, 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 a union to uh, save money, sort of like a, a little savings and loans bank. And people would put money in and they'd get a bonus at the end of the year. And when they had to have a burial or a, or a wedding or something like that, they would have the money from that. The next one shows my mother when she was a little and she was the first live birth because they had, she had twin boys a, a year earlier, but they didn't survive. And later came Uncle Owen and Vincent, and they are also in the book, shown on page, I'll give you that in a second. Uh, page, see, is that 140? Uh, yes, yes, 140. You can see them there. That's Uncle Vincent. Cannot see the slides, cannot see the pictures at all. If you, look, if you look at my screen, you'll be able to, sorry, not my screen, but my profile, you'll be able to see it. Yeah. Okay. The next slide that you've got on this is, is the American Air Base. And between World War I and World War II, a lot of people, and, and it's only now being recognized, came from the Caribbean to fight and they paid the ultimate price. I, I live in Belgium of part of my life and a lot of the, the Caribbean people ended up in Belgium. They lost their last resting places in Belgium, uh, Flanders fields. And they were just, yeah, I mean, World War I and World War II, uh, only a few of them went back, were able to go back and they would tell the story about what England was like. And my grandmother Beatrice had uh, three sisters and one brother and Hilda, Beryl, and Pauline all left for America from here. And, and my uncle George, Frederick is, is one of the people here on, on the uh, chat and his mother is, is Hilda. Maybe he could say something about his journey because he, he remembered, he must remember the journey. So I don't know if uncle George wants to say something. Hello, uncle George. George, you just need to um, unmute. Just unmute if you want to. I, I do recall, I, I live in Washington, D.C., so um, I'm one of the ones that's uh, possibly outside of your, you know, your group in terms of country where you're speaking from. But I do remember um, my Aunt Pauline, we call her PB as in Pauline Brown, that was the initials. Mm -hmm. And my Aunt Beryl, who I call my mommy B, and my mom, who was Hilda in that, uh, in that uh, reference there, she is Hilda. And the Evangeline um, Ruth, I don't know if you're aware of this, mm -hmm. uh, Lynette Evangeline Richards, Evangeline is also my mother's middle name, which is- Oh, really? I didn't know. Yeah. I didn't know. She's Evangeline as well. So I was pleasantly surprised for the first time I was aware of that. And um, your aunt Nan, who we always call Nan, N-A-N, was also a Nancy, which is where the deviation of Nan came in. So it's all, you know, it's all rather interesting, but this Atkinson, 
airport. That is, that is what it was called for ages and ages. And I remember when my cousin Pat, which I haven't seen on your link yet. Um, no, I don't know if he's coming. Leaving, yes, that's, that's, it was still Atkinson Airport. I remember um, we had to walk, he walked out to the field to board the, air, the aircraft. Uh, mm -hmm. In the US, you know, um, almost everywhere else, you know, you board in, within the building, you know, the plane is attached to connections to the building and you get to see, you cannot really see people taking off. You can only see them when they're, you know, going through the barriers, the, the, the mm -hmm. uh, alarm system. All right, I think I talked enough. <laughs> no, you, it just, just confirms what I was talking about. That's great. And the next slide is, is um, something's probably familiar to a lot of you. Um, it's, you see the Lynette Evangeline Richards. Uh, this is my mother and um, her sister, Auntie Nan. Um, and my mother saved two years for the passage for both of them to go to on this ship, the Aranya Stud. And it took that long to get the money together. And they didn't, uh, not, they not only had to have uh, the airfare, they had to be checked medically. They had to have um, good references. Um, they had to have the qualifications to leave. Um, there was, a, there was a, a myriad of checks. Uh, if they had a bad tooth, it had to be taken out. Everything had to be, they had to be perfect before they, before they boarded that ship. And, um, and they, they would have songs sung to them like, uh, you know, if, if those in peril on the sea um, and Peace Be Still by James Cleveland. These were songs that they would, they would have sung to them in the leaving church service so that they would be, they would keep, keep themselves grounded if the, sh if the ships were, were rocky or whatever, because they were going to the unknown. Nobody had been to England before. And um, it was a long journey. Nobody knew exactly what it was really like. They, so they were pioneers and they'd only been 19 years old at this stage. And, this, and the, the book that you see next to it, to, to that, is a, a book published by um, an entrepreneur called, uh, you've probably heard of Nubian Jack, and he interviewed various people uh, who've excelled, who've come as my mother did and have excelled. And this is my mother um, telling about her story and what, she's, what she was able to achieve. Going back to Guyana, it was of course British Guyana, so that's the next slide. Um, and as a colony, uh, the houses were, were beautiful. They were all wooden. This is the, the picture at the bottom, you can see some sugar plantation, you can see La Bonne Intention rum, you can see coffee when they had a slave riot and people just said, no, we've had enough of this. And you can see the inter internal part of the, uh, the, the church. And the next slide, slide is showing Stabrook Market, uh, 1950s under British rule. And what, what's interesting to note is that uh, the, the attitude was, it was very much a place like Cecil Rhodes, uh, like, like Africa, and they invited Cecil Rhodes to, to build the first railway line and he built it. And it was a beautiful place, but poor, very, very poor. Next slide shows typical wooden homes in the street and Palm Street might have looked like this back in the day. And this is showing um, uh, the lady who, was, who, who had friends at number 44. Uh, she can understand that at the, at the bottom of the street, there was La Penetere, it still is there, La Penetere Cemetery. And I remember one of the things that people were saying to my grandfather when he bought the land is, uh, gosh, you don't wanna build something next to a cemetery aren't you afraid? And he said, no, as a policeman. He says, that it's the living that can do us harm, not the dead. So that was um, his, his comment on that. And the, the following slide, please. And these are all the different people. Um, there were five, five races in, in, in at first, but of course, with the love of, of everybody there, everybody kind of mixed up. And in the, in the end, we had a sixth race, which was the mixed ones a little bit of Portuguese, a little bit of Chinese, a little bit of Indian, a little bit of black, and it can be quite a, a beautiful place. 
and the next one shows all the religions because there, there are so many different religions. This is the, the mosque is actually the mosque at uh, in Suriname, but you've got the Hindu temple, and of course you've got St George's Cathedral. And a lot of you may know of Father Derek Goodridge. Those of you who know know him will know that he he passed recently last year, and. Um, he was instrumental in getting a lot of people to come to Guyana. But this book tells the story of people who lived in 47 Palm Street, but all of the, all that happened in Guyana happened to them. When there was um, the various political movements that happened, uh, whether it was um, Chetty Jagan or it was Forbes Burnham uh, or Walter Rodney, all these things were discussed in the house and the impact of, of those political uh, happenings impacted on the people in the house. The fact that there, was no, there were no jobs meant that people had to leave, they had no choice. You had a choice of becoming a teacher, a nurse, or um, you know, something, something in the civil service. That was it. You didn't have a chance to expand your horizons. So England was seen as the way to expand the horizons. And the next one just shows Freemasons in the Caribbean, which is something that people forget that when the British came, they came with all these infrastructures as well. And the way to move forward uh, in the Caribbean was to join such a group. So that's that. Uh, following that, this colony to independence, which is showing the original, the original Guyanese flag or British Guyana flag and how it changed to the um, Guyanese flag. Has anybody got any comments so far? None. Actually, um, um, I, I think it's really great, Ruth, because you are taking me back as well. And I did recall looking at the British flag, which was then with a golden arrowhead. It, it really was historical. Mm. I, I actually just had a, a question for you as well. You, you mentioned that a few people didn't come back from Belgium. Did you just, you did you mean that in terms of that they died in the war or that yes. they settled there? Yes. Oh, okay. And uh, they didn't, they did, they just didn't come back. And they're, they're, they're some of mum's friends, mum's friends, I, you probably know her, Maria, Maria. Um, her, her, father was the only out of three brothers he was the only one that came back to tell the tale of the trenches so that's quite that's quite powerful but it's only recently that people have recognized that you know we've got this this lovely monument in Brixton uh to the to the war dead because only recently has that become something that's become apparent and the other thing to, not, to note is that um, people would go to America and people like Aunt Pauline and uh, Aunt, H not Aunt Hilda, Aunt Beryl, they, they, were, they, they went there and they saved their money and they came, came right back um, because they, they realized, or, or Aunt, Aunt Beryl went to Canada in the end, but Aunt Pauline came right back because she, she wasn't used to the, to being told you can't do this, you can't drink from that tap, you can't go here. They weren't used. They were used to a level of 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 uh, you could call it discrimination in their own country, but they weren't used to the level that was that was there in the south because they went to the, to Washington, which was quite close to to the to the Dixie Line, and a lot of the things that happened in Washington happened a little bit further south too. So they weren't used to that, and they came right back. So um, the next one shows the leadership of the people in Guyana. And of course, before then it was uh, just the queen, but here you, you, I hope you can see all, many of, many of the, the leaders that we've had and some of the current ones. And you'll see at the corner there, there's, there's, there's a, a gentleman who may be familiar, that's Father Derek. And I put him in there because he actually took Guyanese citizenship. He's, he lived there for over almost 50 years of his life. And he was awarded the, the golden arrow. And I, had, I live in Linkfield now, and I was the one who, who did his, had the pleasure of, of organizing his funeral. And um, those of you who, who know him, 
would know what kind of funeral he had. And he was very, very popular for a lot of us here. He was very, very special. Now, next one, nearly finished, uh, is people, uh, you see my mother, it's Mother's Day, I've got to bring her in. And you'll see her at the top there with some people from Agnet with it, with that shawl around her, her which is the, in the colors of Guyana, because my mother, although like many people came and they said, oh, we'll only be here three years, max, and then we're going home. What they, what they forgot to calculate was when they came here, they're only gonna get nine pounds a month. And from that nine pounds, my mother sent five pounds back to Guyana. So she lived on a pound, pound a week. Um, and from that pound a week, you've then got to save up your fare, your fare to get home. So you can't really do it. It's not feasible. Um, the picture below where you see, it shows how, how many people left, uh, Euro Europeans leaving um, Prussia to go to America. Everybody was leaving. The following picture is my mother and Auntie Nan. You saw them as young, young, young ladies and here you see them as, well, ladies of, of a certain age and you see that they've they've worked and they've they've achieved their own homes and etc cetera, etc cetera. you see father goodridge getting his medal of of um, a, his golden arrow you see him with his parents my mother had the luck to stay with his parents when she came over there's me with uh father goodridge again and his 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 church some of you may have gone to that church and one of the stamps. He's actually donated um, his, his vast stamp collection to you all, to Guyana, and it's worth about 60,000. And he's left it to people in Guyana because he had no children. And he's left it to all of us. And that's about it. I, I, I will give you uh, a chance to ask, ask any questions. So please go ahead and, and ask, should you wish to ask any questions. Thank you very much for that. Um, okay. um, Rod, I don't know if you had any questions you wanted to um, ask before I put it to the floor. You're on mute, Rod. Yeah, okay. Um, I, I, I really, I was very engrossed by your story and I was, uh, uh, you, and, you and I and Juanita chatted this morning and I've, I've got my book now, um, What's it? The African Prince of Battersea, and that too has has has, has intrigued me. So I I I, I know you um you, you self published, but certainly uh, uh, plug your books. We have um we have a lot of time for that. Oh, I'd like uh, to see a penguin too. I like penguins too. Ah, okay. <laughs> okay. I don't mind that. That's fine. The, the, you, you know what intrigued me when you first started and uh, chatting about this beauty contest that your your grand great grandfather had uh, that must have been quite something sitting on a chair and saying well yeah I like her I don't like her <laughs> well the, the thing was he 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 arrived there and the person he was taking over from as overseer was totally disliked by by the by the people he treated them very badly. He didn't like being in Guyana. He didn't like the heat. He didn't like the mosquitoes. He didn't like the people. He thought of them as nothing. And so they were kind of resentful. They thought, oh gosh, there's another person like this. And my grand great grandfather thought to himself, well, you know what? When they, when I, if I marry one of these people, then they'll know I'm I'm part of them. And so uh, he, that's what he did. And he said, I'm gonna choose the nicest one, the prettiest one. <laughs> and that's what he did. And uh, the rest is the rest is uh, it's history. It's history, and she was she was for the rest of her. Her name was actually Evangeline, which is why my grandmother's and everybody else got called Evangeline as a middle name. But her her nickname, as you were talking about, was Queenie, and she was always called Queenie. Everybody called her Queenie. Oh, where's Queenie? That was her name. Okay. All right. So this has led me to say that if anyone's going to be talking, you've got to let us know what your false name is as well. <laughs> most, mo most, most of us have no, a false name. I actually think you, you, you can't talk unless you've got a false name. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, 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 I shamedly tell, will tell mine. I, at, at school, I had a very loud belch, and that was my name, Belchie. <laughs> <So>. Oh! <laughs> 
I wouldn't have confessed to that one, Ron. <laughs> no, nah, well, what the heck? Okay. All right, back to you, Juanita. <laughs> Thank you so much for that. Um, I'll store up some questions for, for, for the end. I, I was actually, one, one thing, um, I don't know if you know the answer to this, but I do a lot of oral history recording um, of the Windrush generation. And a few people spoken to me about the repatriation schemes that they had in the 70s. And I didn't realize that the government actually offered quite a large amount of money to people if they wanted to go back to the Caribbean. But I'm just wondering what um, people in the community would have felt about that or whether you know if your mum or anybody had had been aware of the scheme and what they thought about it at the time. I think the, the issue was, was not so much that they didn't want to go back. I think they wanted to go back. But I think when when you go back to the country which was relatively safe, and then you find out that there, as my mom said, that bombs were going off here and oh, cool. people were being, people were being like Walter Rodney being, you know, uh, you, you, granddad said, go take, 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 take Owen, take Vincent, take, take, all my, take my children out of here. Mm. And, yeah. Yeah. and that's why, and you know, now we look back and we say, you know what really, really would have been better if you'd gone back because Okay, we, we got no, you can say we got nothing from the the the, the freedom that we, we we got we we but we we got something very very precious. We got a whole country, mm. a whole country just for us. And if everybody had gone back, could you imagine what the engineers would have made of it? What the what the nurses would have made of it? Our health server would be second to none. But we couldn't go back. Mm. Yeah, no, I think in Guyana's case, it was particularly hard. I know, I, I think um, because it was in the 70s that they were offering the um, repatriation. So it seems to have been largely Jamaicans that took advantage um, of that. Yeah, but yeah they, they were larger in number anyway. But um, yeah, let's let's um, hold any questions for you until the end. And then unless anybody's got anything burning they want to... It says, oh, Patricia, you've got your hand up. Do you want to ask a question? You'll have to unmute. Um, have I unmuted? Yes, you, you have. have yes. Uh, there's, I've just got, I'm 73, and in 1975, my husband had just come out of the RAF, and uh, we wanted to go back because I'd recently qualified as a teacher also. And what we know, the reason that we didn't go back is that friends of family and so on who went back, they were able to hold their jobs maybe for a year, engineers, woodwork, all sorts of, um, they'd, come, they'd come to England in the 50s, qualified and when they saw the opportunity they wanted to take it but for a few of them who did go back and it must have been a large number found they were able to keep the jobs for a year maybe less and then they were booted out in favor of other people coming out and the negative part was if you were Guyanese you were not treated in the same way as if you were from other parts of other countries e.g you mentioned Jamaicans if you were born in England, but if you were born in Guyana, which is what both my husband and I were, we came over, I came over in 57, we didn't have the same advantages. We would be the ones who lost our jobs to make way for the fresh lot coming out. So that's what put us off and lots of other people of our age group at that time. Gosh, that's really interesting. I hadn't really thought about the challenges back home, but it's, 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 um, I was talking to um, Ailiff Harewood about a similar thing and she was saying that she had qualified as an SRN nurse here in the UK mm -hmm. and then when she had gone back to Guyana she couldn't get a job either because she was too dark skinned you know because of the kind of race color and class dynamics in Guyana she just found it really hard to get work then had to come straight back to England so ironically even though it was you know racial prejudice was terrible here as well it was slightly easier for her to get a job but as an SEN nurse rather than an SRN nurse, but yeah. And that was another thing, SEN, SEN and SRN, people, people would come and think they were being trained as SRNs and they were being trained as SENs mm. and then they'd realise they can't, they've got they've absolutely no progression. Mm. I, I know about that. But yeah, even those who, because uh, Aleph is one of the, the few who trained as an SRN and then she, um, a, a, you know, according to her her story, she 
um, got the top qualification for that year, but then was told she couldn't have it <laughs> because they couldn't have a black woman having the top um, grade, grade. And then, and that she wasn't employable as an SRN nurse anyway. So she actually sp spent the rest of her life as an agency nurse, which is completely crazy, you know, given yeah. her qualifications, but yeah, that's, that's. My mother, my mother got to the top of um, her, her, the game, basically. She, she was in charge of St. George's Hospital. She was in charge of Wandsworth. Um, and she was one, the first unit general manager for women, children, uh, uh, in ever um and she was she was really really that's why she, people that's why she's got a couple of pages in this book mm. and she's been given so many awards and she created agnat which some of you may know um which is uh, association of guyanese and allied guyanese nurses and allied professions mm. which um did so much for uh Guy guyana health services uh as well and um, she, she, she actually got the top prize as an SRN in Taunton and went to um, the Queen. One of the pictures in the book shows you her going, going to the Queen to receive, because she, she did so well. So that's the other side of it. But one, one last thing I wanted to say, there, there were people like um, Elmo Hughes, I don't know if anybody knows him, but he was a teacher and he went back to Guyana and he went back because Burnham had said, oh, we, we need you back here. You're a teacher, come, come here. He was supposed to go to Harrison College in Barbados. He said, no, I'll go back to my own country and I'll do it there. And he actually had to run away because it was so bad. Um, uh, he wasn't being paid. He wasn't being taken care of. He put his children uh, and his wife on, on, on a plane. And then he, he acted like he was going to work. And he, he went across the border. So um, that's, that's the other part of why people didn't go back. Mm, that's so interesting. As, as you mentioned your mom, actually, I should, I should uh, also mention Daphne Steele, because I know Daphne <laughs> became, uh, was she the head of a maternity or something? I, I can't remember the position that she got to in the NHS. Rod, do you remember? She was one of the, I think the first black matron. First black uh, matron. Yes, matron. yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. and then that, that of course is the sister of Carmen Monroe. Exactly. We all know. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Patricia, before you go, did you then return, um, uh, having encountered uh, problems in the seventies? You you moved here in fifty seven, went back in the seventies. Job. No, no, no. no, actually, we didn't go back because we had so many. Because once we told my parents who'd brought us over, and my dad came in fifty five, we came in fifty seven. Um, then they started telling all the horror stories about what I was happening to their friends. So we didn't actually go. My, my ex actually landed a really good job with NATO. So we went to, to, to Germany, to NATO. But in terms of the SRN, SEN, even in my family, I've got um, an auntie who came over as a qualified SRN, but found that they wanted her to work as an SEN. Mm -hmm. So the NHS actually lost a lot of qual the ones who were with it because some of them accepted the jobs and didn't realize till they came and started working that they were going to work as SENs. They didn't actually understand the difference sufficiently, yeah. whatever the reason was. But my auntie is a good example. She's at 85 now and she's one of the few who just left nursing completely mm. because she just was not going to do SEN work when she was an SRN, there, there was a big difference at that time. Yeah, so I, th I think I noticed that well, a lot of people went to the States. I mean, you think of like E.R. Brathwaite being a trained physician from Cambridge University and then not being given the opportunity to do that and having to, you know, become a, a school teacher in a rundown part of London. <laughs> so yeah, in inevitably you're gonna, you, you know, you either leave or do something else, I guess. Um, but I noticed Colin Babb as well, you said that your uncle went back to Guyana in the 1970s and came back to the UK due to the same sort of political, social and economic um, turbulence. That's yeah. really interesting. But let, let's move on. Um, unless anybody's got any final questions, I think we'll move on. And I'm going Thanks to... Thanks so much. 
You're Thank welcome. You. Thank, Thank you. you. Actually, sorry. That was like moving on swiftly without putting our hands together. <laughs> sorry. Uh, 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 what a role in a conversation here. I just want to say thank you so much, Ruthie. So, sorry to interrupt, but I do have a question or a question for this wonderful speaker. Can can I can I have Yes, the... please do. Please okay. go ahead. Uh, my name is Philip Litcutt, um, from Guyana, of course, living in Atlanta. First of all, thank you for that wonderful presentation. Um, a comment, a question, and then a, 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 a comment, a statement, and a question. Uh, first of all, um, who took that picture of the old cottage in, um, in, in Georgetown that you showed? It's a beautiful picture. Oh, it's just, it's just a picture that I, that I had. You know, when I was going around Georgetown, I'd take pictures of the, all the different houses, you know, because you... Well, I hope I can get a copy of that. But my comment is, um, you, you've really actually encouraged me to continue my own memoirs of growing up in Georgetown. Um, I start, I stop, I start, I stop, I start, I stop. But I think after having listened to you, I'm going to uh, pick it up once, one more time, which leads to the question. I'm fascinated with, the, I, with two things, the diaspora in which we all live. And this, for lack of a better term, this nostalgic urge that we seem to, ex to express now, what, what causes that? Um, could you have any, any ideas, any comments, any thoughts? I think it's the, it's the, the, the wonderful potential that we, we have uh, when you look and you see um, how, how, rich mineral, how, how rich we are in minerals, how rich we are in land. And the fact that we are all scattered all over the planet, um, and we're not we're unable to um, enjoy and benefit, even or participate in cultivating this this uh, this potential. My granddad always used to say, "This is the best country on the on the in the world. If only we had good leadership." And that's that's uh, you know the situation we've had many years where we haven't had great leaders uh you know getting rid of the railways is is a backward step we can say and uh th that sort of thing is maybe you know when when there was 50 years of of uh, of 60 years of of guyana and you showed the films of uh, the railways there were people that said we had railways we didn't know that imagine what that would do imagine how many how how much if you add a couple of miles to railways every every year, you'd be at Brazil by now. Where would we be? We'd be fantastic. We'd be, you know, the, the number one. We could have been the Singapore of, 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 of South America. There's no reason why not, you know? Yeah, we were, in, we were independent at the same time, I believe. Yeah. So it, it's just who we get as leaders and how we interpret, how we, how we react to those people. And in some ways you're bound to fail. Uh, there's too many other people's interests in, in, in the land. Um, and I sent, sent uh, Rob something about when the Scottish troops came to um, Guyana. Mm -hmm. And maybe that's something that could be shared later, but it just shows it was almost, it's, in some ways it was still a colony, even though it was independent. Yeah. I, I, I just come in there, Ruth, um, can I come in there? Yes, of course. Hi, hi, Ruthie, lovely, lovely presentation. I did enjoy that. Much. I do hope and, you like and, and you have, um, really bring up some issues for me. I know you mentioned um, people coming over, I'm going to go back a bit, coming over and being SCNs and SRNs. And I tell you what, I've just researched that. And I feel that even if they had said whatever you were coming over to be, they would have still come over because we wanted to come here to make ourselves better. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what a lot of us have done, actually. We've oh, come over yeah. and made ourselves better. And it, it, nothing would have moved us from not doing that. So mm -hmm. yeah, I appreciate that. And guess what? Only the other day I had a meeting with the diaspora because I'm, I've been running my charity as well. And it's how we go around in circles because they actually said to me, do I know anybody that wants to come back home to teach? And I thought, what? Absolutely not, because that's a bit of a titchy subject. 
I know there's a lot of people that um, I come in contact with that has gone back to Guyana and when they were when Burnham had said to come back, they went back and they didn't get a good reception. Um, it was absolutely horrendous for some of them, they had to come back. Mm -hmm. Some people were lucky that they hadn't sold their property here. They had rented it out, they were able to come back to their property. And, but the experience that they had, because these nurses that they were going, some were going to be in charge of a ward and these nurses that they were going to be in charge of were absolutely not having the, 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 the um, what should, how should I put it? Not having the ethics that he, this, these people were going back here with from here. And so they couldn't cope with it. A lot had to come back. Thank you. Thank you for listening. That's so all I wanted to say. But Thank you have you. touched a nerve with me. Thank you, Lynette. Thank you. Um, I just um, uh, wanted to come back to what Philip was saying. There's, there's, a, there's a phrase that always stays in my head, and I can't remember who said it, but it's this thing, this kind of thing about the past being a place to which we can never return. I think nostalgia is something that you have as adults because you're thinking about your childhood, but that childhood no longer exists. So the only thing you can do is kind of talk about it and celebrate it in this kind of a way. And I don't think it's necessarily just Guyanese. I mean, maybe the Guyanese feel it a lot because we're part of a diaspora. So you're at an even further distance from that place that was your home. But um, yeah, I think it's, uh, as for nostalgia, I think it's common to everyone. And it's, and it's, it's, a, it's a form of history making. You know, yeah. it's really important that we have nostalgia in order to talk about the past and kind of measure how far we've come or what where we where we still need to um, build ourselves up and um, i i can i come in again i think too that it's very important that people get right in because there's so much history is going to be left behind when they go and there's nobody to say where where they're they're, they're at or what happened uh, along the line. And I've been encouraging a lot of my friends to start writing um, and putting it down on paper because some of it is hilarious and some is facts and it's absolutely good for us to read those, those, thing, uh, those um, episodes, yeah. Absolutely. And the other, the other thing to mention is that um, oral history is just as valid as documented history. And I think it's very important for people, if you've got children, get your children to record you exactly. telling stories about your life. Yeah. And if anybody's interested, I'm working at the Institute of Commonwealth Studies and I'm doing oral histories for the Windrush generation, which includes Guyana and Belize and, and you know, everywhere that was Anglophone Caribbean. So if anybody is interested in the project I'm working on, do get in touch with me as well and you know that you can do that via guyana speaks at gmail.com but um meanwhile i want to move on um just seeing where we are with the time so we're gonna go now to carl and um carl i'm gonna spotlight you because i want people to be able to let me see if i can spotlight you there we go um and then i'm gonna bring up your slide so here we are and Carl you're going to take us on a trip down memory lane Rod just um while I'm doing this just be aware there's people that are still coming into the waiting room but okay. please just make sure you're only giving access to people who've got their name got spelled it. out all I right think, um Ruthie mentioned there's somebody trying to come through Lanray um but um I can't tell which one is him because he hasn't spelt out his name. So I don't know, Ruthie, if you could let him know. He just needs to um, spell Yeah, I'm there. I'm there already. Oh, you're here. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. Excellent. Okay. Excellent. Okay. So we yeah. don't have to worry. So there's three at the moment, Rod, who haven't Thanks. got there. So you can ignore All right. Them. All right. So now where am I? Um, let me just get Carl on my screen. Otherwise, I'll get lost. So here we are. Carl. I want to focus with you on your broadcasting days. And uh, thank you so much for all the amazing photographs you sent me. But before I do that, can we just start with a kind of, just give me a little, little background. I'd like to know like where you were born, uh, a little bit about your childhood growing up, your family. Good, good afternoon, everyone. Howdy family, howdy everybody. Okay, great, I'm um, Carl. Brown Abrams. I was born like Rudy in Georgetown, British Guyana, then uh, Georgetown, 
17 Hatfield Street working rust. And uh, my early years was in Georgetown, but then my growing years was in Mackenzie Linden those days. And then a bit from there to Burbies, uh, the West Coast Burbies, and then to Rosic Knoll. So I had a, a vast way of moving around and uh, experiencing and living in various parts of Guyana, so to speak, at the time. Um, what else can I say? Um, well, so, so, like, yeah. so, so Carl, you, 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 there's so much I know that we could talk about, <laughs> but what I wondered if you could start off with, can you tell me like when you first got involved in broadcasting in Guyana and, and what was the, I, I mean, I'm see here it was, was it Radio Demerara that you it were It was in? Radio Demerara, yes, it was Radio Demerara, and um, for my growing years, I, I did not, as I said, grow up in Georgetown. Um, when I left the Mackenzie and then the Burbies region, then I came to Georgetown where my working year started in the 70s. Um, I then, I did other work before then, but then I joined Radio Demerara, then Broadcasting House. Actually, I was just looking through my, my old Radio Demerara ID card. And that's my first ID card working with um, Radio Demerara as a control operator, sound engineer. And of course, the days of radio was very interesting. It was challenging. At that time, people did not have television, so they depended a lot on radio. And most of the programs were designed for, um, of course, from the teenager, the young people right up to the olden days. So it was everyone was crowding around the radio at the time and wanted to hear um, the, the type of programming was designed was it from family end of things. Looking back at people like, um, Edgar Metal Hall's uh, um, um, his stories in my bones and my flute, which was narrated then on radio. So it radio was very, very important at the time. Um, take it from there. What else? Can you um, tell me something about the Radio Demerara building itself? I mean, who, who, who built it? Actually, that broadcasting house, which was situated in High Street, um, it does create a lot of memories to me. Sadly, we've lost it um, due to, of course, changes in policies and whatever but that was built by Rediffusion, um, built by the British BBC it was one I think it was a home to many very uh, popular broadcasters and it was also a home to many of us it was like my, my second home where it was one of the best recording studios we had in Guyana at the time you had people like um, all the Caribbean uh, artists would go in there to record um, I had the likes of me, you had people like Mighty Sparrow and all those people that came down. That is Bertie Chancellor. Um, Bertie Chancellor, God, he's dead now. That's just in control room. That's Studio A, um, where Bertie Chancellor was the Chancellor Pops. So there was Radio Demerara then before we moved to the GBC. Um, they merged, but it was owned at the time by Radio Fusion. And uh, you had a lot of people that worked in the in the area like Pat Cameron as a Bernie Chancellor. I worked with a number of people at Vibrant Cambridge. I can go right across the, the divide. Um, you have people like Alda Freitas, Angela Messiah, uh, Ron Robinson, Ray Robinson, Ayub Hamid, um, Christopher Dean, you know, the whole lot I can say that I had my working with Pancho Carew, uh, Matthew Allen, um, Bruce Thomas. These are all people that, but my, my inspiration I think came from um, Pat Cameron and and Andy Freitas, Bobby Reese, Ben Curran. These people were my inspiration to broadcasting. More so, Silas Dolphin at the time talking about education, where I had my eloquence uh, lessons from, and, and Silas had me doing talking about education. So, radio at the time was very much the thing. Um, now you don't have radio broadcasters; you have disc jockeys, and I think. Um, Sadly, the, the, the radio quality is deteriorated and not as it was before then. You had to be someone before you got on the air. You could not, Rafi Khan and of course, Terence Holder. These are people that were in my, my, my world of broadcasting. So um, can you though, just going back to the actual, the building itself, when you, you were talking about like Studio A, how yeah. was it divided? I mean, were there several different studios? Yes, like, you had, um, there was Studio A, Studio B, Studio C, and Studio D. Um, studio A 
was basically the small studio which where Bertie Chancellor sits there, and across there was Control Room One, which is where I was working in. I've been there, and then across the other side, behind the glass, was Studio B, and those where you had major programs were pre-recorded, like Cathedral Challenge, um, um, any um, programs that to do with onshore young Guyana team, live studios were live studio programs were done in there, Studio B, but Studio A which is where that little, that's a small comfy studio, you get in there, it was soundproof, you couldn't hear, when you get in there, the door was, the doors were sealed, so when you get in there, you couldn't hear a sound outside, you could only see people, but you can't hear anything, and they were well, they were professional design studios done by the, by the British, and as I said, sad we lost that, you had the departments, which was, you had traffic and scripts, which was responsible for doing commercials, and looking after that, then you had the newsroom, then you had the sports department. And so each studio, each person had their own uh, work cut out and everyone respected everyone. Anyway, you get in there and it was like business as usual. And it was really- so, so, Carl, tell me, tell me more about your role. What was your role when you first started? I started as, first of all, a sound engineer and um, as we call a control operator, which means I was responsible for doing all the sound anything to do with the from the time programs are to be aired all programs that had to be on the air would come into that room where i am and my job is to ensure it gets out as broadcast is put on the machines commercials you work along with a, a, a broadcast announcer and you're in control you've got all the music sheets everything you are in control of that um live news coming in from the bbc your your job is to bring it up and uh, ensure it's, it's, it's clarity, it's done technically. So I was doing a lot more technical work, um, live broadcast, you would go out and do that outside to ensure that the sound get out. As a matter of fact, looking back at some of the incidents, I remember going out to do a live broadcast, a church broadcast one Sunday, and I was asked to make sure the link was okay. Got out there and then sadly, um, sadly we, we got there. And, um, when the time yeah, yeah. was on, bear with the... me a second, Carl. Somebody's talking. Yeah. I just want to um, make sure everybody's got themselves on mute because I can hear. Um, yeah. might be... I'm just checking everybody and putting them on mute. Okay, go ahead. Sorry about yeah. that. Yeah, so we got out there. Live broadcast was on and thinking it was happening. The church service was happening and um, it didn't come on the air. So when we got back into the studio, of course, Avi Brewster was my manager then. And I did embarrass the studio so bad, the station so bad, because your whole one hour broadcast was lost due to negligence, which I think had I not listened, pay attention, I would have done a better job. But anyway, and then you got a chance of meeting other people and coming to, so the studio, the studio itself was really tight controlled. I mean, whatever was coming out on radio, because as I said, there was no television. So people listened and whatever comes out on the radio, there was educational as well. So you had the two fractions, you had the GBS, and then you had the Radio Demerara. GBS was more a little more up market, up tempo. Radio Demerara was a little more controlled and much more the for the elite, but educational. Until so was, radio, was it Radio Demerara that My Bones and My Flute came out of? Yes, that came out from okay. Radio Demerara with James Sidney, who was then the narrator then. And then as time went on, it merged and became the GBC. It became uh, Ghana Broadcasting Corporation, GBS and Radio Demerara. That's my ID card again. I've got so about- So Carl, Carl, tell me, when, when, um, what years were you actually there then? When I started in the 70s, the late 70s, actually 79, 78, 79, I joined Radio Demerara and I stayed up to 1982. 1980, 81, 81, I left when we merged, became GBC. And then after we came to GBC and things started to change a bit. And then I migrated to the Republic of Suriname, where I went to work for KBC Radio again as a full-time broadcaster. I got my KBC ID card here anyway. <laughs> and I got all my ID cards. And then after working with KBC, I started with Radio Penty. And then I moved to another radio station, Radio Paramaribo. That's my ID card for Radio Paramaribo. So I was a broadcaster there again for another two, three years. Okay. Well, Carl, let's, go, let's go through the slides. Let's yeah. tell me who it is. This is Bertie um, Chancellor. What Bertie Chancellor. Do? He was in charge of the library and he was responsible for all the music coming into the studio. 
and and he had a program called Pick of the Pops. So um, he would pick all the, the greatest hits and then he'll have them out there every Saturday. But Bertie Chancel was in charge of the library then. He was the librarian for the music. That was Pancho Carew, Matthew Allen, Terence Holder, which is in the middle and on the left across with, um, that seems to be um, uh, this uh, Terence and this is uh, Ron Saunders. Um, that's Ron Saunders? Yep, that's, yeah, that, not, I can't remember who that was, but I know that's Terence Holder. Okay. In the middle, and then that's uh, Ron Saunders. And they were from the GBS fraction, okay. and that's Matthew Allen across with Pancho Carew. Um, that's before when we became GBC, and there's the GBS days and we became GBC. So I was like working along with these people as well. And so tell me what each of these, what were their roles? Well, all the Pancho Kuru with a cigarette in his mouth, Matthew Allen, they were the top broadcasters at the time. Um, that was uh, Terence Holder and of course, um, Ron Saunders. They, Ron was a broadcaster, Terry's manager. I can't remember who the other guy was, but they are managers and these are both the two broadcasters along with um, yeah, Ron Saunders. And they carried the radio. I mean, at the time, everyone listened to radio. It was was more listening. Um, Carl, Carl, like Carl I remember Pancho. Yeah. And, and he loved the echo chamber, didn't he? Yes, he always had to have his reverb or his echo on his voice. But he was very, very dynamic. That's Matthew Allen, yeah. doing the live outside broadcast at the time. That looks, like, is that, is, that's that looks like Eddie Grant. It is Eddie Grant. OK, I thought it looked Eddie like Grant, him. Was like, no. Eddie, Eddie came to Ghana, I think, for the first time. I think when he produced that album, I think Electric Avenue it was, I think. Um, okay. Yeah. So those were those days. Um, Ayub Hamid, um, he was the rated Amrara fraction, and he was much the Indian presenter. So every Sunday you have all these Indian programs, which were really, really cultural. And Ayub Hamid was one of the top. There's Ayub Hamid and there's Isri Singh. And there's also Pretty Kumar. But these were, we call specialists in producing cultural Indian programs along with um, Lakshmi Kalicharan, God bless her. But these were the people I worked with as well. Um, Sunday morning, uh, late in the uh, Sunday afternoon, strictly uh, their specialist in Indian programs. So were they, were they? Was it? Were they sharing things like was it Indian music or? Yes, it was literature? strictly Indian music and um, the in the, but everyone listened because you had a choice of I mean when the radio is on there's nothing else so you you either listen to the program or you don't so you find a lot of the cross section of Guyanese people on a Sunday would listen because just after that another program would come on of their choice of English music. So you'd find people listening all the time. So Guyanese became, there were one, actually it was united. So you didn't have this problem of, oh, I don't want to listen to your music or whatever. Everyone, that's where I think my music um, uh, broad spectrum came from because I was introduced to a lot of music across the board. I learned classical music from Indian to Chutney, to the whole lot. I don't classic, I don't have a problem with any kind of music because I adapt as soon as it comes in I adjust to it and when you deal with people like Silas Dolphin, Edith Peters, God bless those people who introduced you to the music genre very across the board you have to learn you as a matter of fact when you're doing radio you have to have a music appreciation if you don't have it then you're not worth to be there you know you that Brent Chapman he works in the sports department uh, I think he's still around um and he was again from the era of he started with uh, GBS and Radio Demerara as well, and he's from the sports department, Brent Chapman. Mm -hmm. uh, Pancho Crew, as you yeah, yeah this Pancho Crew, um, who was very very good. Um, there you had Cecil Griffith, and he was he came down. Cecil came from the when we merged from GBS to GBC. Cecil was one of the top news editors. He would edit the news and make sure it's on the on the dot at 12 o'clock, whatever that news has to be out there. These guys are professional and the the no nonsense guys as we speak it. I mean, it's like, okay, you gotta go, you gotta go. And um but, but so Carl, if you were if you were to describe what Guyanese radio was like to someone born and brought up in London who, you know, may have Guyanese heritage but had never been. Things like the death announcements and things like what what what, what would be the typical days kind right. of radio program? The, the era, I mean, the radio era then 
to now. It's totally different, but at the time, radio was more professional, very much professional. And you have, it was formed on the BBC, right? The format for radio then in Guyana was formed on the BBC sort of a scenario. The death announcements would come on at nine o'clock. And because again, there was no television, when that announcement comes on, it was the more somber time. It was a somber time where everybody drops what they're doing and get around the radio to hear that announcement, right? And there's this, this agonizing piece of music that would come on and then the silence would come in. The announcer who does the death announcement, his voice is very pregnant or her voice is very somber and you listen and everyone, and you can't say a word. The minute in the house, you, you, you start to shh. Shut up, you've got to be quiet when that announcement is on. And when someone, you're talking, when someone dies, you may not know the person, but unless coming back to the false name, if that person then got a false name, you don't know that person died. Well, this is this body's like, oh, Anita Cox, known as Drake Art or something like that. It has to be a AK known as. And you will then say, oh God, that person died. Moving from that part to when someone dies, it's very much in Guyana, a big thing. It is mourning, especially as a family. You over like here, you have to have invitation to come to the funeral, or you have got to be invited. You don't invite. You know the person. Especially I'm going to the, I'm going to the countryside here. When someone dies in the village, everyone turns up at a house in the village, right? The wake is on, and everybody brings something. And the body at the time does not go to the parlor. The person maybe at the back of the yard in an old refrigerator or in an ice box and the ice is packed on the body for the next funeral the next day. So it's done, the, everybody in the village comes together. There's somebody who knows to wrap the dead and do all that and is dressed there at the back of the yard, the coffin is either made. And so it's a thing. So that's where we talk about the deaths, uh, death announcement and stuff like that, going into the countryside. And we can expand a little bit more on that. Oh, expand, expand. Would you say it was the most popular program, Carl? Death announcement? <laughs> Sadly, yes, it was. Because everybody will know who dead. <laughs> who, who dead? Oh, God, dear, his body dead. As accidents, um, I did have a few um, times of, and you, you, if you grew in the country area and you had country life, the days when people are scared of the death and, and zombies and things, you, you, you have no fear because your fear is stripped. I recall being an altar boy in, in, in the country, St. Albans Church, where I had to be mingling with the dead. I mean, you know, the coffin is coming in and you just go in the church. Well, I was one time becoming, going to become a priest. I wanted to get into priesthood and I was being trained. So what the priest would do is like, if a funeral is coming in, he let me bring the, the, the body in while he's preparing to come before he comes to the church. So I'll get in there. The body's in there. The, the body might arrive early and I'm in the church with the body there while I make sure everything is okay. So you become fearless and, and you, you become a part of that, even though it's a stranger, but you become a part of that. So it also gives you strength to understand life a little bit more. But the villages and, and people in the village were more warming towards you everybody sympathizes with you and yeah it is more of a family thing funerals are you not know, like now where it has to be by invitation you can't go da, 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 in Ghana. and even if you don't even know the person you see people turn up who don't know people and they're bawling and screaming like anything else they break down and they're crying even though they don't know anybody but they're crying with you <laughs> things like that so it was um yeah something to look at that's the bit of country life as well coming back the radio days, you know, if you look at it from that point. That's really interesting. I, I just think it's really unique because, um, you know, we don't have anything similar here in the UK where you, you have, have it in the newspapers, but I don't think we've ever had it on TV or no, radio no. in the same no, time. It's a big thing. I think funerals and death yeah. announcements is a big thing. They have it on TV right now in Guyana. Somebody dead is, and especially, yeah, exactly. it's a tradition that's carried on. on. It's I, I, I wonder if it's to do with, I was looking at statistics for deaths in Guyana up until about 1927, the average age, life expectancy was 30. Mm -hmm. And it, it was, I mean, deaths, which everybody was just dying from all sorts of things, yellow fever, you know, dengue fever, whatever, they were dying. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't until I think they got rid of, um, you know, really 
was it malaria? I'm not, but I know they haven't got rid of malaria, but I mean, there was a period of which yes, a lot of the mosquitoes lot. had, yeah, yeah. they've gotten rid of a lot of the mosquitoes, but um, yeah. and now we have people living like well yeah, into their hundreds, too. but um, it's just, yeah, I wondered if it came from that because the rate of death was so, so high. Yeah. But um, yeah, so this is, so which I wasn't clear who Cecil in this picture. Cecil Griffith is the one on your right. In and the black or in the check. Yeah, he's the news one. I'm not sure who's the other person, but that's just of Griffith. I mean, you have people like Vibert Cambridge as well, Dr. Vibert Cambridge, who that's Cornell Ferdinand and that's Studio A. Cornell worked along as well. He's now in the States. He celebrated his birthday yesterday, but Cornell Ferdinand was also a broadcaster. Then that's the GBC days um, when we became GBC. Uh, he just got into Radio Demerara and then we emerged. You know, that's what it looked like then. Um, that's me in my early days. Um, I was in the yeah, middle. I was <laughs> that's in Studio A. I was Wonderful. presenting a program in the afternoon with Bobby Reese at the time called it was um, I think it was Teenagers' Choice, where the, you have the teenager going and you present your own selection of music. Um, the these two girls, Pamela Ramanandan and the other girls, it was Pamela's choice. So I was the moderator. I'd open the microphone and then I introduced them and likewise. So I'd control that program in my early days there and then. So were there other women? Because it seems to have been a very male dominated. No, kind they of were, but I think I worked a lot more with you had, yes, they were. There's people like Pauline Garner, Angela Messiah, Pat Cameron. Oh, that's in shoot control room one, my early days at the control board there. Um, that was the Gates console, which I worked on. And I think somebody came in with a camera and I was like, just about saying something and they snapped that picture. <laughs> I'm, not really I, I'm loving the glasses, Carl. <laughs> oh, those were the days when you had big glasses. Everybody, it's just a fashion, you know, yeah. and the plaid trousers and so on. But it was, plaid, plaid trousers, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah so you know, I interrupted yeah. you though. You were talking about the women. So um, yes, you had, as I said, quite a numer uh, numerous, uh, numerous announcers in the female piece, that's apart from Margaret Lawrence. You had Pat Cameron, Auntie Pat. She, God bless her, she's passed on. Um, you had Pauline Garner, Angela Messiah, that's Auntie Come See Pauline, um, Pauline Thomas. And she did a program called um, Every Morning, Auntie Come See. She's coming, howdy family, howdy everybody. How? And she talks like about three or four minutes about something about the country life in Creole. And then she says, let me see, oh my God. And she was actually, she's in Canada right now. I think she's about 90s in her 80s, 90s, but yeah, Pauline Thomas, Auntie Comsey. She was one of the first, I think, Creole people that came on board um, every day. And that's one of the things about radio. Um, we, we try to keep Guyanese dialect, the Guyanese culture alive. You have people like Mark Matthews, Bruce Tom, um, Mark Matthews, Wordsworth McAndrew, um, all these people about vibrant who are cultural? Um, what, who, what about Ken Corsby? Ken Corsby. Uh, Ken, but Ken is more or less from the Caribbean, but I'm talking Guyana. Um, you mean, had a, a quick. What do you mean? No, Ken, 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 Ken was Guyanese. Ken was Guyanese. Was, was he? Yeah, Ken Corsby. Yeah, he is. Right. 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 Yo, yo, Ken, Ken, Corsby Ken, Ken is there right now. He's yeah. Yeah. I was going to give you a Ken, good My apologies. Minute. My apologies. <laughs> you know what? My apologies. But yeah, it was Ken and Mark. Yeah, yeah. them too. Did them too. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I'm trying to recall. I'm trying to go back them so far two, now. Two. Yeah, no, 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 yeah, I, I know. Them two, two. two mm -hmm. that them three. <laughs> exactly, it's them two, but Ken and Mark was really, really great. Yeah. They were dynamic. and um, But what they did was kept Guyana culture alive. We we had our vernacular. We, it was a judge, don't think it was. Mm -hmm. And I always said that Guyana's divided as we know in the counties where we've got our dialects. You had the Georgetown dialect, and yeah, the Georgetown guy, dialect would say, Yeah, man, guy around the corner can catch you later. You got the Linden dialect, and I'll see a man, and then you got the Burbies dialect, me go, me come, me see. and then you got the East Coast across the people on um, Virgin Newton and those places. So we had dialects. So I don't see reason why we've got to go Jamaican. Not being bad, but I think we have got our own. So let me, as you say, let me talk with your own thing, you know what I mean? And it's one of the most beautiful things of vernacular Guyanese dialects are really great. And I oftentimes plead for people to just let me talk Guyanese, you know, uh, what, what, the way I do a thing like that, you know? I mean, we can't say no. I go, I give, I get, I go, I go. Which means like in Surinamese, I go. 
yeah, I'm going, <laughs> you know? Gosh. And then you go back to our little... Um, I, always, I always used to like um, Edgar Middlehouse's... Uh, my bones and my flute. No, no Edgar, Edgar Middlehouse's sister, Lucille Middlehouse. Uh, her mother always used to say, I'm going for do you. <laughs> no, I'm going to do for you. I'm going to do, do for you. you. <laughs> I'm going to do for you. <laughs> you wait, I'm going to do for you. <laughs> Well, that, yeah, I mean, my grandma used to say, yeah, for you, for you, for you, for you, things like that, you know, but they're rich, it's, it's our culture, it's rich, I mean, mine might be able to take me on that. So tell, me, tell me a little bit more about Auntie Kamsi, so how long was she, was she? Um, she was the radio for quite a few years before she, yeah. might, I mean, she started when we got to rate GBC, GBC, when she joined, when we merged. She came on with that special early morning. She was on at, at about 7, 10 in the morning. So as you wake up, it was waking you up into where you are. And she's out, she was welcoming you and saying, how the family, how everybody? And then she talked a little bit something about some Nancy story or somebody, something that is really funny. Yeah. Um, but she leaves that with you in your mind for the morning and you go out. Yeah, remembering something. So, so Carl, tell me, were these were these broadcasts? I mean, are they recorded, or is this kind of lost to the lost to? I'm the sure show? they may be lost because um, I I recall that's Bernie's oh, mantle. Don't, don't lose your track. I'm going back. They may have been lost because what? <laughs> yeah, they may be lost because um, some may be archives. But then I know when the the, the broadcasting buildings, I heard that the number of tapes were left thrown away. Some were saved. Some were not. Yeah. So a lot of them have not been archived, but I'm sure someone's got them somewhere along. I've got tapes of um, some recordings I did with um, talking about education, Celeste Dolphin, which I have on cassette and things like that, because I ensured that when I was leaving Ghana in the days, I had those programs to take with me as my CD when I go to work in another radio station. Yeah. But some things are maybe still in the archives. If you go to the NCN, I think the National Communications Network, which is in Ghana, you probably will be able to get um, some of those tapes still still there, you know, with voice recording. Bernice Mansell, she was always the, Chris, the needy children's fun appeal, and she was there from the days of Rainy Demarara. And Bernice had the most soft, um, appealing voice you'd ever heard. When she, when she starts to beg, that woman could beg for these. She could beg. When she started telling you, oh, but the children need you, please give some money. You got to give, give all your money. She is that kind of person that really... She was a fundraiser for, for charity. Was. Yes, yes. For the, every year, the Christmas, Christmas Needy Children Fund, she would, um, they have a special appeal. And she'd help the poor needy throughout. And she's wonderful. Um, yeah, she, she's great. And what about um, Pat Cameron? That's Pat Cameron, Auntie Pat. Um, Pat was, oh, she's awesome. Um, when I started working and uh, then Pat took me under her wings and she used to do a program called Woman, Home and Family oh, well, and Woman's World and Woman's World in the morning, uh, in the afternoon. And in the morning she do one. And I went in there as an operator. When you're working with these broadcasters, because of the discipline and the strictness, as a sound engineer, as an operator, you are in control. Their job is they bring you all the music, they've got the program and whatever you do. And in those days, when you work with radio, you work with sign language. And it's amazing. I didn't realize only now that how important sign language was because in the studio, announcers did not talk much to you. It's like you go in there and they look at you and they give you a sign, means spot on, on the nose, start the program or on the nose means you're right on target on the time and if they go if you want to play a commercial or they say start the program the theme so you work with sign languages and you've got to be able to read and things like that you know or you got one minute to go speed up you know we're going to come off the so it was pat was one of the guides and people that um, guided me a lot on that and uh, yeah, she, God oh, bless me. What, she, what, what was her actual position? What, what was Pat position? was one of the top broadcasters, senior announcer, producer. And she would go out to do a lot of work. She loved outside broadcasting. She loved the classical music. And one of, um, she loves the people. I think there's a song that she always liked to play, Sending the Clowns by, um, who is Sending the Clowns? One of these old tracks. But she loved the old crooners. Um, 
I know, I can hear it now. So. Yes. <laughs> she loves yeah. these, these, but she was very <laughs> articulate. Yeah. And she would visit the homes. She, she loves doing the, going out to the outside broadcast, visiting the palms. Um, she, she taught me what it was to, to understand people who were living in the palms. I traveled with her to do outside broadcasts, uh, especially at the Mahaika Hospital. Um, a lot of people may not have known that the Mahaika Hospital was where they had for the lepers or people who got cockabe. And, and it was the first, I went there two, a few times with Pat to meet these people and to see how they lived and we cared for leprosy. And then I understood what it was, people who were in those homes. Carl, you have to rewind. People got what, cockabe? Leprosy, cockabe has. That's what they leprosy. called leprosy. Yes. Oh, I didn't know that. Annie can talk about that. This, this, she, she's very quiet on that. But yeah, yeah, people got cockabe. So you got cockabe. It's, it's leprosy. And Rob, so I, you look like you want to say something. Me? Yes. Yeah. yeah well, th there are just some names that uh, I remember from my memory. Um, Ruben Diodat, you know that name? Ruben, Ruben Diodat. Oh, he's on the Doctor, list, Rod. Dr. Ruben huh? Diodat. You're jumping. He's on our list. <laughs> okay, sorry. B.L. Crombie? Yes, um, B.L. has passed on. Yeah, sports. Yeah, and, and That's Alma, Al Alma Rolaire. Alma Rolaire, yeah. I I didn't work with Alma. I think I she she was with the GBS. But okay. um, Roland Phillips, I worked with Roland as well. God bless him, he's passed as well. What did Roland Phillips do? Roland Phillips, yeah, he was he was a DJ um, presenter, but he was very much more. He was also a musician. He he sang and he played the guitar. But Roland came. I think Roland left when we we became GBC. He left uh, the later years and he went to the US. But I think I heard he passed as well. But Roland was one of the dynamic broadcasters. Rovin Diodat, uh -huh. Doctor Rovin Diodat. As long as the Rovin, as well as this Baby Karan, who I worked along with, all these people were under my, uh, I was under their umbrella. Yeah, what, Rovin, was Rovin, what was Rovin's special? Rovin area? was was a pub. He worked in current affairs and PR, mm -hmm. public relations. He's in current affairs. He's strictly into current affairs. And he was into a lot of news as well, but strictly current affairs is Rovin. Um, Terrence Holder, he was my manager. Um, Terry, God bless him, he's passed as well. Uh, he started in the GBS, but then he became the manager for the GBC. So we worked, he became my manager. Uh, very quiet guy. Uh, never know when he's coming through the door, but yeah. He was there. <laughs> I like his, I like his typewriter. Oh yeah, those are the, I have got, look at this today. They're like, what is he doing on that thing? I have got two of those typewriters here. And as a matter of fact, I learned to use the Hermes, which is my favorite. Because when I went to typing school in Benin's in New Amsterdam, I, the Hermes was my favorite typewriter. So I learned it's good because it, it, it enhanced you for the computer these days. We have to type. Well, Carl, you know what Rod got me for um, Christmas, uh, December 2021, um, was a 1921 Corona typewriter. Oh, okay, 21. <laughs> yeah, so there's 100 years of the coronavirus or something. <laughs> I don't know what he's trying to say, but yeah, I got one of the really old fashioned typewriters. They're I've so got amazing. Two of them. I've got two of them, and they're, they're awesome. They really do work. Yeah. Um, yeah, but looking back at those days, um, that was with myself and Pauline Gardner. We were presenting a program in the afternoon. I forgot what it was. Um, Pauline is now in the States. Her name is uh, She's not the Pauline Darcy now, but yeah, she, that was the days in Studio A and then in Broadcasting House in my so, early so, days. So, Carl, I can't resist asking you because I know that you were working in radio when there was the Jim Jones. Ah, uh, that era. Um, yes. Yeah. Was, Do you remember um, any, was there any radio coverage of the event or anything? There was, I won't say much radio. It was sort of very quiet because... I, I do recall, and I always keep saying it, that the last day when this thing took place, Sharon Amos, who, they had a program called the People's Temple Speaks. Um, they would bring that program in um, ever so, it was aired once a week or twice a week. And they bring the tape in and gave me the tape. I think they did say to, I had a tape. And when Sharon gave me the tape the afternoon to be put for transmission the next day, I remember I was training, I was doing some work elsewhere. And as I was going, he said, give me a drop there. And I said to her, look, you're looking very disturbed. What's the problem? 
She said, no, I'm fine, I'm okay, but something wasn't right. But when I got there, that's when it erupted. Um, but then when the, the, the radio stations, at the time, the GBC, when I got in, they pulled all the programs off. Uh, nothing to be mentioned about with Jonestown and the people, because I was even planning, and I said to Sharon, when I take my holidays, I'd like to go up to Jonestown. And she said, yes, we'll take you up there. They had a band that used to come every once a month called the People's Temple Speaks. It was called the Jones, Jonestown Express. And they would then have a live recording in the studio, live broadcast. And I would work on that program. I did Saturday morning. They had good musicians. So that, again, was another yeah, sad scenario when the problem took place in Bel Air, where they found her throat slit. And, you know, so much happened then. Who's this, Sharon no... Amos? Sharon Amos. She, was because... she American or was she guy? Yeah, she was American. American. Um, then you had, you had Mark Lane, who came down the week before a lawyer, Mark Lane, I think, to do the investigation. And so when it erupted, I think just Sharon dropped me that afternoon. She went home the evening. I think they, they drunk, her kids were drunk in the, in the bathtub in Bel Air. And then they heard through the slit. And they didn't know who did that, but apparently it was seemed to be orchestrated. And then that was the last of Sharon. I mean, it's uh, really sad. Gosh, that's horrible. Yeah, it is. It is. But the, the whole experience of us living in Guyana through the year and the times, as I said, it goes back and go back to Lyndon Mackenzie, my early days in Lyndon again. And as I said, leaving Georgetown, the, the Burbies area, those pictures about the, yeah, so much to talk about. <laughs> no. yeah let, let, let's not stray too far we're gonna we'll, 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 come, we'll, come, we'll come back in on that let's uh, so um i'm gonna i'm gonna leave i'm gonna park jim jones for now because i know we could yes. talk a lot a lot about a lot about yes. that and there's it's a lot that, um there's a lot that i think guyanese don't talk about in relation no. to jim jones and quite how present they were in a way in the society i know they were they had like games between you know, Jim Jones would bring, a, uh, did he have like a basketball team or something that would come into? Yes, I mean, and... yeah, because remember, they used to bring them down from the interior, um, like they'd come down, the, because it's a long journey, it seems to be, and they were good in, I mean, because all the American players, they're basketball teams, they're yeah. musicians, they were really the creme de la creme, you know, and it's amazing, I don't know, were they all looking for the good life, you know, and yeah. And, and and psychologically being we'll, 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 we'll do that as a as yeah. a, a separate program because <laughs> there is a lot I know, I know. At, the, at the radio station yeah. all i know is that i used to put the program on i used to make sure the program gets on there professor vibrant cambridge who worked with the gbc and he was very instrumental and he also he's now in the states a uh, doctor vibrant cambridge i think he is and he's been he was with the army and he used to do the armed forces program and then he moved on. So he is really one of the creme de la creme of radio. Well, I think that's, let's, let's come to the end of that. Yeah. Um, before I say thank you to you, Carl, um, can you just tell me a little bit about your grandmother? Because you, you, I always hear so much about her and I just wondered, <laughs> in fact, I know what I'm going to do. Um, no, just, just tell me a little bit about your grandmother before my I granny, My and granny was my inspiration. Oh, well. Yeah. I didn't, I think most, most of the days in the early years, people grew with their grandparents. So um, it had this thing about looking back in history. I um, mean, a lot of kids were born into wedlock those days and the grandmother would take them over and bring them up because of some mishappening. As I said, I was a bastard. In them days, they call you the bastard. You're born with your father, Marty, your mother. So at the end of the day, is a bastard. So your grandmother take over you and you live with you and that's how it go. And she, yeah, it is a fact. And, so you, your grandmother nurtured you in. I didn't really get to know my mother until my early year, my little later years in growing, but yeah, she was there. And that brings me back to going back to the Irish car and going up to Mackenzie. So my grandmother sort of took me on board and ensure I was in the right direction. She was there, very strict. She worked for the English people in those days in Mackenzie. She was working with the people called the Clathwardies in Wutuka. You must have heard of Watuka. She was yeah, I've been to Watuka House, right? Yeah, nice. so she worked in those areas. So she was very eloquent. She was very Englishified. And so as you, you couldn't, you had to speak proper. You know, there's no way you could speak properly. You, could talk no, proper. properly. you have to talk properly, <laughs> proper. Okay. And so she guided me and ensured that you went to school and 
if the pictures of Mackenzie, I went to Mackenzie Primary School, I attended that. And um, she would always say things like, even where she, where she was going, she took you with her. So when she's moving from point A to point B, you are there. And when you walk down the streets, especially when you're small, you hold on to your grandmother dress tail. You got to hold on. You just hold your hand, you hold on for the, the dress and the tail and you're walking with her. <laughs> I don't know if anyone experienced that, but you have to hold on to her dress tail and so you wouldn't get lost. And if she, yeah. if you lose it, then she knows that you're gone. Yeah. So she would turn around there. Um, she had a lot of old sayings and as you grow older and you, you start to be a bit maybe rude, she'd always tell you, um, for you, for you, for we not for you, she would say things like that. Or she'd say to... Um, if if you playing stupid, she always said, Chupin a doctor, cockabek and cure. And she'd be there telling you that. So you gotta be okay. Or she say things like, if you're trying to be a fool and don't be a fool, because if you think you don't know what you're saying, she say, big ass no, he must his poor Mr. Ross, till he see you walking down the road. And he said things like that. She said things. So these little things will nail into your head, you know. <laughs> what is her name? You didn't mention her name. Oh, yeah, her name was. Claudia, she used to call her cousin Amy, but she's Claudia, Claudia Reynolds. So she was from the Reynolds from Belladrum and a Belladrum. So I had a bit of living in Belladrum on the West Coast for peace as well. Mm -hmm. And so my era was growing a bit in the country. So I knew things about chopping wood in the morning, getting up five o'clock in the morning to fetch water, full up the drums. I knew things like, of course, where mosquitoes are biting, you have to get a smoke pot. So those days when the most people in the country know that when there's a mosquito, instead of coil or destroy, you get the tin and you get the husk from the coconut and you put it inside the tin with a little bit of kerosene. You light it and you spin it around. It creates a smoke. So you walk with your smoke pot up and down the road where you're going because there were no electricity at the time. It was very dark. It was dismal. You had the red roads. So it was black. And then what do you see? Candles, the houses were. So, but you can see, I mean, you develop a sense of awareness. So at the time, like in the morning at five o'clock in the morning, you know, or four o'clock, you hear the fall cock crowing, you know, that is four or five o'clock, you got to get up. Um, I would walk to get milk. I had to go to get milk with my grandma. I mean, I'd walk like about a mile and a half. I had to walk from Belgium to Letiti Estate. To, um, I'm yeah, just that, sharing this picture, Carl, because I, I wondered if you could explain this, what, was, what this is. Yeah, this is what you call in those days, um, that is a, a, a mud, mud, uh, mud, uh, dabbing, the dabbing, that is cow down mixed with mud. And what it does, it makes a very firm sort of a wall. It's like cement, but it, it, they plaster that on the floor and also the walls of some houses. We have thatched houses. But what it does, it keeps the place very cool in the, in the hot sunny days. It's amazing how it, it's like an air condition. It keeps the place very, very cool. Was and this something that was done, a, a, done a, um, like what part? Was this in Barbies mainly? Yes, I know in Barbies because I saw this in Belladrum on the West Coast Barbies. I didn't yeah. even see houses like that. Um, they get the, the roofing is made with um, coconut branches, mm -hmm. dry coconut branches and they are uh, sort of like half dry. They, they touch the houses with that and then they would, um, you mix, you pick up the dry cone down, mix with mud and it becomes like a poultice, but it's dabbed on the floor and on the walls. There's a, there's a way in which they do it, but it's kept there. Even the rainy season, it's, it's there. It doesn't really, it doesn't go off, I think, but it's well, really, really good. Carl, you've been fantastic. I'm going to move on now quickly to, to, to um, Pauline and, and also to Joan. But first of all, everybody, please put your hands together for Carl. Really Thank you appreciate very much. That. And I hope I'll be able to share lots more because there's so much. <laughs> I know. We need to do a Carl part two, part two, <laughs> part three, part four. <laughs> So um, I'm just going to take the spotlight off you. I'm going to put the spotlight uh, on Carleen and also on Auntie Joan. Now let's see where Auntie Joan is. I can't see her now. Where's Auntie Joan? Yeah. There she is. Here we go. I can see you at the spotlight. So thank you so much. Um, I, this has been a really long guy to speak, so I'm sorry for keeping you all waiting, but I just, I thought it was really important to get out as much out of Carl as possible about the radio. Um, but it is Mother's Day, Mothering Sunday. So let's refocus and, and end Guy and Speaks on a lovely time with two amazing women who have been regular supporters of Guy and Speaks, for which uh, Rod and I thank you both. Um, Carleen Baggett and Joan Plummer, 
you're really welcome to Guyana Speaks and um, thank you for joining us. I just wanted to start, let, let's take this in turn. If I could start with you first, um, Carleen, could you just tell us a little bit about your background? And make sure you're, you're, you're both, um, oh, Carleen, you're on, on mute. I think I'm Auntie Jones fine. Right. My name, hello everyone. Happy Mother's Day to all the mothers. My name is Carleen Bagot. Um, I was born in Bagotville, Canal Number no. One, at my grandparents' home, Emily and Anderson, Emily and S Simon's house, um, where I where I stayed sometimes. And you were asking um, also um, things about um, uh, when I came to the UK. Well, I would say I came to UK as a teenager in 19, in, um, sorry, in 1968. My years in, in, in um, prior to that, my years were spent between my maternal grandmother and my paternal grandmother. Where I was born in Bagoville with my mother's parents, when my parents um, came to this country, I shared ownership between the two. My father's mother lived in farm village, uh, we call West Coast, near Parika. Right, okay. Right, as I said, my early memories um, were in Eiflet, where my father and mother lived. My father was a mechanical engineer who worked in the um, Eiflet sugar estate. My mother, she was a um, housewife because in those days, most women stayed at home and to have the midday lunch, of course, with husbands coming home to eat their lunch. So wives stayed at home. I didn't, well, most of them, they didn't go to work. I was, um, I can remember um, going to Iflux School, Iflux Church of Scotland School, when think about um, for about a couple of years, because I would be the age around about five, four or five. My first memories was at kindergarten school in the days you write on a slate, A, B, C, D, and that sort of thing. If those from that age could remember, you didn't have books, but it was a slate. And um, I, I, um, I, just to say, Iflux School was sort of vivid memories. I could remember, because if you think about it now, this is like four or five, you know, but the thing about it is, my great aunt, which is my, uh, my father grew with his great aunt at um, Ifla. Me reason being, you know, in the days when you have a lot of children, you farm one or two out to, to your sisters or brothers. So my father ended up with my great aunt, um, Matt, um, um, Matt Dowell, Miss Matt Dowell, her name was, and she lived at Ifla. We call her gram, I call her gram for short for grandmother, but that was how it turned out. And so I stayed with, with, with them at, at Eiffel. When my father left to come to England, that is when I went to stay in farm at my, his mother. Her name was Virginia Bagger Times. Um, you know, childhood in Guyana was very interesting. I don't know about the children here, there was trees to climb. There was so much to do. I mean, you talk about the train, your life was timed by the train. You know, at five o'clock train in the morning, you know, it's time to get up when it leaves Parika, you know, and it blows when it's passing. And it comes let, to let me, let me share, <laughs> and let me just share while we're here, because I know a lot of people, um, hang on a second, I have it somewhere, here we go. Um, oh gosh, you got a posy as well. <laughs> I've got it all, but as I, you I called it. To, I wanted an image of the train that, station. <laughs> that is the train. I mean, the one they had up East Coast was more powerful than the one that had up West Coast. But at the train leaves Parika in the mornings, the first train about um, quarter, to five, quarter to five, by the time it hits farm, it blows from Lady Stain. So if you were, and they had like a street dam in those days, it was not no, no much of a road. You know that if you're late, you're running for the train down the street dam when it hits, when it hits farm, that's five o'clock. And then the next train is a six o'clock train. So they're all, the village were all timed by the train, you know, but everyone um, enjoyed the train. I must say, it's a shame that it went 
I was so sad when I heard the train wasn't there. You know, it broke my heart really. Cause train, we lived by the train and people earned a living by the train in Guyana. Um, selling um, fish and bread and uh, salt fish and cakes, you know, all those sort of things. Um, you know, so- Were people selling that at the stations or were there people inside the train selling- No, people well? at the station, that's how, because as the train stopped at each station, not farm so much because farm was the first stop on the um, on the West Coast train, or after at least Perica. Places like Tushin and those sort of places, people would sell things and as you go further further along the line, they will sell things, have the shops, they come out and, because remember, when you're leaving home, it's like four o'clock in the morning to catch a train. So you really don't eat very much then, so you're just busy, you know, getting on the train and along the way, people selling their fish and bread, that's, that, that, that's, that, that, that's when you buy. Auntie Joan, sorry, um, Carleen, I'm just going to go to Auntie Joan because I can hear she's moving her. Auntie Joan, what are you doing? <laughs> she's in our kitchen. That's not me. It's not you? No. Okay, I was wondering who was making. Okay, so let me just check and make sure the. Uh, That's not whoever. me. It looks like somebody, Lorraine. There's a few people with their. Um, um, their uh, mutes needs. Okay, so we've sorted that out. Um, Auntie, Auntie Jo, can I come to you briefly? We're going to come back to you, Carleen, of course, but I just wanted, uh, I, I know that you haven't been well, and I'm sorry I've actually kept you on so long before inviting you to, right. to speak, but um, can you tell us a little bit about your background? Where were you born in, in Guyana? I was born in South Road, 2 p.m. in the afternoon. <laughs> my mother was Clarice and my father was Harold. I'm Joan Time Fook. Okay, of course. So, the, so, so Plummer was your married name? Clum, Mr. Plummer married me in England. Okay. <laughs> when did Enough. you come to England then? I came in on the 31st of April 1972. Okay, so uh, um, not that long after Carleen then. I think Carleen said she came in 68 or something. July 68. 68, yeah, so not, yeah. not much longer after. It was so, 36 years old. <laughs> okay, so it's you you were... Uh, years, eh? No, so you, but you spent most of your life in Georgetown then? Yeah, I never went anywhere. I you traveled. Know? Yeah. I lived in Brazil, I for two years, off and on. Yeah. Because I was friend, I was, uh, my partner was a Brazilian. Okay. So so tell me, did you, um, when you were in Georgetown, like what was it like for you growing up? Was you, did you live with, you know, at home? Who, what was, who was in your home, for example, you know? Nobody. Nobody, <laughs> just you? <laughs> I, I was told that I went to my grandmother at nine days old. Wow. My father's mother, and there I stayed. Do you know I, any more about the story? Well, no. No and yes, because that is what I was told. But I grew up with them. Mm -hmm. My grandfather had a shop in Crowell Street next to Raymond Drugstore. So I grew up in that shop. Every day they went there. So, so did, oh, you got, you got a phone call now. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you shut them up. Okay. So, so you lived, you lived oh, about later. In you lived above um, Raymond Drugstore? No. The shop was next door. My grandfather, J.C. Tankfook, had a shop next door to Raymond Drugstore so in this... Crowell Street. But so do you... We know... lived in Brickdam, 56 Brickdam, <laughs> at the corner of... Lime and brick dam. Okay. And I grew there until I was 10 years old. 10, 11, 12, 
something like that. I went to Smith Church School for the small school, and then I went to St. Was it St. Stephen's? Up to from fourth standard to third standard. But when we were <laughs> talking about the dead, when we were in fourth standard, every, uh, every day when you leave school, the same way you come out, file out one behind the other, like in parlor was a corner away. And the whole class would be running one behind the other. We gone into liking, we go wrong all the day, <laughs> have a look at <laughs> each one of them. You, you run out and you're gone home. <laughs> that is just too funny. <laughs> that was our entertainment every day. <laughs> mm -hmm. It was so funny. People crying over the dead and we going, look, gone. <laughs> I'm surprised. I'm surprised one of the adults didn't come and try and lick your tails. <laughs> Nobody stopped us. No. We did it every day. Wow. That was our entertainment. <laughs> so, so just for the people online who, who maybe don't know, Lycan Parlor is, is, is the funeral parlor, basically. Yes. You see all the people dead in their coffins lined up. <laughs> Lycans, yeah. Like, <laughs> and it's still like that today. Yeah. Wow. That's that's really. Um, it was. It was fun. It was more entertainment for us. <laughs> but you never, you never recognize somebody in no. the in the coffin. Or you... No, I never. We never know who they were. You see, I think Georgetown people must be very different from Pomeroon people because. We had one guy who was told his father died and he didn't even want to go inside the mortuary to identify him because there were so many dead inside the, the mortuary. He thought there was going to be Jumbi inside. <laughs> so, when children, you don't know any better. Yeah. <laughs> about seven years old. Oh, goodness. But, but so, so Auntie Joan, where, where, did you ever um, spend any time with your mother or had your mother traveled somewhere? No. I did uh, part of my life I didn't know who my mother was I know who her mother was I I used to go and stay with my grandmother some weekends when my father go down there my mother's mother so where did she live where did your mother's mother live in Blankenburg okay he had a little shop but I used to see her every Tuesday because that was her shopping day and she used to come and buy from my grandfather's shop. So what can you remember about <laughs> her? What, what kind of things would she say to you? Who? Your, your grandmother, your, your mother's mother. I would go down there on a Sunday uh, on a weekend. Well, this is funny because I grew up in the big house that had electricity, had fridge, had this, had that. And when I went to her house when I was small, and it's eight o'clock, and she liked the light, the, the gas light and the lamps, I start to cry. I want to go home because it's dark. <laughs> <laughs> I think I have, I, I, I'm just going to see if it's like this one. Let me see if I can find it. Uh, yes. Is that, that lamp, yes. Oh, a lamp. <laughs> oh, and I would cry all night and grandma would say, John, don't cry. <laughs> 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 but the next morning she's going to say, and what do you want to eat, John? Curry fowl, Grandma. Oh and she God. gone and killed the fowl. <laughs> <laughs> oh, gosh. <laughs> Amazing memories. So, I know. so tell me, did you also travel on the... Because it sounds like you never really left. Um, did you travel on the trains? 
yeah, I went on the train, but most times my father used to ride the bicycle from Vivian Hoop to Blankenborn. I used to sit on the bicycle cross bar. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so you never went on, let me see, one of these? You went on the back of a, a donkey cart? Yeah, he, he had, my father had donkey cart, he had abies. He had he had horses under his house. Mm -hmm. Actually, this this one here says Wong's Garage. I don't know if anybody remember Wong's Garage. <laughs> Is that the name up there? Looks That's like like, probably in Camp Street. Camp Street, yeah. Yeah, like Camp. yeah. Camp Street was Wong's Garage. I I always and and you ever traveled in the yellow buses? Yeah. Well, my stepdad was the conductor of these buses. Albert. So where, what route did he used to tra tra um, travel? He, he, st he stayed right there in the, uh, at the depot in, in Starbrook Market. He oh. controlled the buses. Okay. Mm -hmm. Carl, I can see you, you want to come in and say something. Yeah, because there are two things I want to look at. First of all, the train. Yeah. Nearby, as um, Ali was talking about, because the train was from Georgetown to Rosignol, that route which I traveled on. And when we talked about the, the fish and bread and the, what would happen when the train pulls into Mahaika, it was the first stop, then the Maikoni, what people used to do is like, yeah, all these sellers would come with the fish and bread on top, but we used to wait until the train is about to go, about a few seconds. And just you hear the whistle, you call the people, oh, you want a fish and bread? And they'll come. And by the time you, they give you the fish and bread, you get them the money. Pulling out, you just, they you, got all the money, you got all the fish and bread, and they got You no are money. bad. <laughs> so I remember <laughs> that doing that bad. a few yeah. times. And then coming back to Auntie Joan with the yellow buses, those was motor transport. Yes. And they were up in Water Street was the depot mm -hmm. as well. And they had a turnstile. They used to go through various um, routes like Sussex, Campbellville, West Rumveld, and so on. So I remember those yellow buses very well mm -hmm. as well. May yeah, my stepdad was the conductor. He stayed right there in the mm. Starbrook Market. So can I ask, can any of you remember things? Did you ever attend things like um, Quequas or what? I mean, oh, with, oh, definitely. Oh, so Carly, yeah. tell me all about the Quequas. <laughs> the night before the wedding. Night before the wedding. You got yes. to have the Quequa, the, 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 not the drum, the Congo drum, and you dance mm -hmm. the, dance the Quequa and you tell a lot of old stories and things like that. You have to know yeah. how to dance and dance, shush yeah, your foot. It's a, put, it's a special way of tushing your foot to dance quick with, to dance the quick with. Oh, yes. But also the, the quicker then apart from the quicker, you had also the comfort. The oh, the, that's a different dance. Yes, that's a different that's one. The spirit, where you that's get, a spiritual where you dance. Ant the spiritual one. We yes, used to get yes. the banter. Yes, you, they yeah. have to go to the cemetery to invite the ancestors yes, to come yes, to that fun. dance. Yes. Yes. There's a real woman in the village as I was a child. Her name was Tant. That's all I know. Her name was a, a sort of African yes. lady, and she'll go to Good Hope Cemetery, mm -hmm. and she invite mm -hmm. the ancestors to come to the dance. And about um, afternoon time, when the drum started, they yes. have a normal drum, but then. It, the change, the rhythm changes when the spirits are coming and she start walking backwards and what, say, yeah. clear ganja, clear ganja, and she throw in high wine. Speaking yes. high wine. High wine was the thing, you had to get high wine. And if, if you were a child, meaning you, when she said clear ganja and you enter in the middle of the hall, the spirits you would knock caught. you upside down. You <laughs> it, it wasn't a place for children. That no. particular dance is only for grown-ups. Yes. But as a child, my head used to turn when when the con when the conquered yes when the con my, they used to have to hold me down because we had a village hall and when the drum starts the African drum starts I was Not I was you. going my head's going if they didn't hold me down I'll go oh, so wait 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 I, I'm confused so is this with the the, the conga drums yeah this the conga yes. drums yes because it's two different dance you have a yeah. dance which is um conga dance which is just normal. Uh -huh. But where they have the comfort dance, comfort which is dance. a spiritual, yeah. real oh, so spiritual dance. the comfort jam. dance is the one that knocked you down. <laughs> yeah. Yes, yes. That's right, the one right, the right. would knock you over if you don't clear, clear, clear the way. 
but that is the one that used to have to hold me down when the drums start. I would want to go. The head's gone. So, so when, when, when would they hold these comfort dances? Like, what are the we main had, events? We had a village hall. We had a village okay. hall. And the comfort dance is usually a nighttime dance. And mm -hmm. that's when the spirits come about 12 o'clock at night. That's mm -hmm. when they would come. But the conga dance is like when you have weddings. Say you have a wedding, and the next day they'll have a conga dance where they pin the money, the back okay. to the ancestral things, Africa. Yeah. They'll pin the money, and you have to pay in order to dance with the bride. The man has to pay. And okay. the woman will have to pay to dance with the bridegroom. And that was a way of the way they collecting some money for right. their for their now going on to make their life together. Yes, right. that's that's what that dance was about. So you also one, had um, dance would take place in a quekwe at a quekwe event. Yes, yeah. No, quekwe is a different thing. That's no, the day different thing right before well. the wedding. Oh, before the wedding. Okay. Mm -hmm. And the Congo dance is the day on the Sunday after the wedding. So that, that's that dance. And okay. then you cook, that's when you do cuckoo and okro soup and Congo take cuckoo. And that's sort of old, now this is real African stuff. That's when that came in. So what is Congo tea? What's that made from? Congo tea was made from when you have the pita cassava. Uh, no, when you have the bit of cassava, after the top of it, after you've grated the cassava, the top of it, you soak it in a bucket of water yeah. and to get out the bitterness. And then you dry it in the sun on the rooftop. And right. when it's dried, you pung it. Okay. And it gets like a flower and that you may get conga tea dumpling and things like that. Okay. And you make I only know conga tea and when you say, wait, get, get. That was the song, but Conga yeah. Tea had a purpose. Yeah. Okay, yeah. that's so interesting. So, Angie Joan, did you ever have any kind of cultural events that you went to for weddings or? No, 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 none mm -hmm. of that. So, mm -hmm. do you know if the Chinese? So, did the Chinese community have any? Um, specific events or not no, really they we, so they realized they kind of no, mixed with everybody no, no they didn't have anything it's just like English yeah okay mm. so it's, it's like they've lost all the culture a bit mm. so let me ask something something yeah. be, be, because we, we spoke about funeral parlors being entertainment what about the cinemas you got you got Strand Metropole Plaza Asta Liberty um, yeah. were you Carl, mm -hmm. were you were were you a balcony house or pit? Where did you go? I used to, first. I started with pit first, and then I moved up to balcony because after a certain times you got because pit used to get lots of bugs. Okay. <laughs> oh dear. <laughs> I used to go to. Well, actually, Strand was my favorite. I used to go to the Strand. Strand. And then, but then the days of cinema was so good because when you had Strand, Metropole, and then you go across Astor. to Astor. Asta. And, and Plaza, um, Asta plaza and, no. and Plaza. Can I and, come? and then you had the one in um oh gosh, you had the one in Camp Street. Camp Street was Plaza. Empire. Yeah. No, Empire, Empire. Was, it was Middle Street. No, Empire, Empire was Middle Street. Was middle street. Rialto was Kitty. Mm -hmm. Kitty yes. Okay, okay. And, but, and the thing about the Quekwe. Oh yes. The Quekwe, I think I, the Quekwe was when you when you listen to once you listen to when they were singing. It's like telling the bride of what marriage life is going to be like. Yeah, that's true. Because you say, um, shining cup and salsa, shining cup and salsa, shining cup and salsa, I'm something for me, love. No matter you see me stanza, no matter you see me stanza, no matter you see me stanza, we can rock down iron bedstead. And where you see these women broken down the iron bedstead, you don't know where to look. That's yeah, and then uh, <laughs> man, the man is saying, uh, "My grandmother, my grandmother, you see, um, you come, you came from from Bagazil, and I was born in West in Stanley Town, and my Ooh. grandmother lived at Larry Street, yeah, and I down the bottom, she, and, and she took me to this quick way, the Carols, somebody with the Carol family, the Carol family, and and they say, um." Uncle Joe, give me more, let me go. Let me go yes. Oh, let me more, let me go. And when they say, mm -hmm. you don't, you know, I said, and the man is saying, I don't want no long division, woman. 
He don't want to want to spend any money. He don't want a woman to spend too much of his money. He said, I don't want no long division woman. And <laughs> let me please people, I can't go home and tell my mother that my grandmother, my mother is this Christian brethren. I can't go home and tell my mother that my grandmother took me to this quick way. Oh, no. <laughs> You know, it, it was the, uh, it may not have been come, me not got no, oh um, my not dead, yeah, for so man, it may not be come, me not got no, oh um, my not dead, yeah, for man. And, and it, it's a generation that go with it, you know. You yeah. know yes, of course. <laughs> the movements. Yeah. That's a. Uh, but then the, the, it's, now uh, it came up when you talk, when Carl was talking about, um, hmm. it come first? Pat Cameron. Oh, Pat, yes. Uh -huh. I went to school with her. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. She was in a higher form of myself at Bishops. And when um, the, the other child was talking about Daphne Steele, mm -hmm. Daphne mm -hmm. Steele and I met Enterprise High School open 1st September 1939 with 12, with 12 students on Brick Dam. And Daphne was one of those 12. First, and we were, we, um, so we were like started our high school together and we mm -hmm. remained friends until whatever. Mm -hmm. She went into nursing and I went into teaching, but we mm -hmm. kept the contact. I used to visit her in Ilkley when she became a matron at the, at, at the matron at hospital in Ilkley. And if you're visiting Daphne, okay, you've got to decide to stop because every second person stopped her because she was either midwife to someone or friends to someone. Or, yes, she was very, dad. very popular. Doing so I do have good... Um, they've, got, they've got a plaque for her now somewhere in Balham. Up yes. The hospital where she, where she worked. Back in the days in Guyana. Yeah. Um, if I can... Um, so I, she, yeah. But that bag of that bag of tell you know, was... was the West Bank. Oh, you on your, your uh, answer yeah, yeah, yeah. choice. Bear with me a second because we're going to do a Q and A in about five minutes. So I just want to round off and we'll. we'll oh, yes, it doesn't matter. I just at last thing the yellow buses. I knew Albert. Uh, where was Joan? I knew Albert. I, I worked with the, um with, with the yellow buses. The bus conductor. Uh, okay. Her yeah. Mother, her mother. Well, Joan knows about myself and her mother. <laughs> and, and are you going to share the story with us? Martha, my mother was all my dresses, and she so didn't I, have patterns. Clarence, would, you would you would take a book with a, with a fashion like this and show her. Mm. I, said, eh. I said, all right, come for a fit and so and so. so. She, she didn't make patterns. Something slightly difficult, and she would get it, and she would take a piece of newspaper and cut something to see what it was. Yeah. And she was very particular about her handwork. If you put on, if, when she was finished with your dress, if you put it on on the wrong side, you couldn't be ashamed. You can wear it. Yeah, you can wear it on the wrong side. Wrong side. Yeah. Because once I wanted to go somewhere, she wasn't finished. She said, bring it back and let me fix it. Mm -hmm. so I, mm -hmm. I wore it and I had to take it back for her to do the, the wrong side. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, are you finished with me? Um, no, I'm else? not. I want to come back to she's, you. She, she's <laughs> going to run. To I, 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 hold on a minute. Hold, okay, Let, order in the house. Order, order. <laughs> <laughs> Before Carleen comes back. <laughs> Bear with me. I want to come back to Carleen. Carleen, tell us a little bit more about your school days. What was it like at school? Well, school days. I, as I said, I attended um, Iflux Scott School for a little while. Yeah. Then after my, you know, after my parents left, I went to farm and I attended um, Good Hope Anglican, Anglican Church School until the, that was um, rebuilt and it became Greenwich Park Government School. Um, very interesting school days. The headmaster there was one Mr. Eric Bart who lived in um, Denamstel. He and his wife, I think his wife came from Essequibo somewhere as a child, I don't know where, but um, they came every day. And my teachers were Miss Mayers and, and one Daniels. They both, you, in those days, you only know teachers by their Mr. Um, um, last name. Yes, you never really name, get yeah. to know the, 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 the first name. And I think they've all immigrated to, um, to the United States. We had the uniforms. What was the, the um, Colin, What was the discipline like at school? Very, very strict. Very strict, but fair. I would say very strict, but very, but fair. Now looking back on it, did you have really, corporal punishment though in those? Uh, yes, in you had the you cane. Had, you had the, the cane. cane. Okay. You had the you had the cane. Girls would get it in their hands, and boys would get it in the pants. 
but the usual thing, you know, you put line your pants with newspapers, that's what the boys would do. <laughs> so when you know you have to get four or six, six is when you were very bad. But girls very rarely get it. And uh, I think boys, some, some teachers were naughty, they'll hit you across your back and things like that. And that wasn't very nice. Mm -hmm. But um, it, it, they were fair. The uniforms were the usual white shirt and um, navy blue pinafore. And it has to be starch and stiff and crisp to go to school, you know, in So those can days. you, did you, um, you know, I was showing the, um, the um, iron. Oh yes, the flat iron, yes. The flat iron, yeah. I was just wondering if you'd you, used Yes, the... I did. That was the only iron they had. You, yeah. If you lived in the country like farm, you had the coals and you put the flat iron in the, on the coals in the coal pot. Right. And you had like, in order to make it smooth, you get the dried planting leaf and you would rub the iron on it to get out because when the iron goes on the fire, it gets like a gray color. Uh -huh. So you had to smooth that out or else you get your clothes dirty. So, and then you press oh, that. So you, you, you heat the iron on the coals mm -hmm. and then when you take it off, you wipe it clean with the... You wipe it clean with, with the plantain leaf. With the plantain leaf? In leaf, you know, the dried ones. Yeah. So it, may, it takes off all the whiteness from the iron. Oh, and then, then you use a cloth now to clean that all off, and then you start pressing. Right. In those in those days, the men had what they call these khaki trousers. <laughs> those were very very difficult to iron. It must have taken forever to iron. <laughs> well, you, <laughs> after a while, you, you get used to it because yeah. it's like everything else. In the night, you prepare your clothes for school. So in the mornings, you already have your clothes prepared. All you have to do, like um, Carl said, you have chores to do, you have drums to fill and all those things with water. You have goats and sheep to tie out all before you go to school. Yeah. You, had, you had a day's work before you start the journey. And to get to school, the distance like about two miles, mm -hmm. you had to walk to school. So if you were clever, what you would do, you would hold your yatin boots in your hand, coconut oil stockings, that in boots in your hand, and when you get near to school, you put what, it so on. So you're, you're walking to school barefoot? Yes. Bare feet, of course. Yes. Oh, I see. And you've got a bit of cloth in your bag. So when you get near to school, you just wipe off the dust, red dust from your foot. Oh, wow. And you put your yattings on because when you get to school, your yattings must be white. It so must for not people be brown. Who, who, people who, who, who don't know what yattings is, they're like plimsolls. Plimsolls, yes, plimsolls. Right. The English call it plimsolls, but yeah. it was yatting boots. And you had to wash them and you have a whitening thing you put on them. So it was very white when you get to school. Right. No discolored looking shoes. You had to be neat, neat, your nails short and neat and tidy, your hair well groomed. That was school. Yeah. And in the morning you had it like, they call it here assembly, but you had like... um. You sing songs, you had hymns, yeah. you had hymns to sing because it was a church school, you had hymns to sing and before you even start your work. And as I said, you had like the books were like the royal readers, mm -hmm. those of the age who knew of the royal readers and Caribbean readers books. But did you learn? Did you learn anything about Georgetown or was it things or all like Yes, British you learned they, they, we call it um um, general knowledge mm -hmm. that was general right. knowledge part of um learning about georgetown you learn about the kaicho falls you, you now i mean i've visited now but you you hear about it from since i was a child and um you had um also english history a lot of english history a very little of the west indian ones until west indian readers came in and then they start talking about um the different islands and things like that but basically it was mostly english those of that era know all about that. <laughs> uh, Auntie Joan, what was your school like? Was it similar? Similar to that. You, so you had the same discipline? With yes, they used to look at your Before nails. You finish. Oh, you they, would, they would check your nails. And check put, your put nails. On, put, put on the um, open and if, that thing. If your nails were dirty, oh, just, they used to put you in the microwave for now. Okay, all right. You move, did you move all my... It's okay. I'm just muted, Carly. <laughs> um, if nails were dirty, they used to hit your hands with the ruler. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Wow. 
Uh, so, so, um, uh, but Joan, did you when you when you finished school, did you work in Raymond's um, drugstore? No, 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 no. no. So, I, so I didn't. I stay home to look after my sisters. Mm, dear. Oh, my so you had younger. So, so you didn't go to secondary school. I went after uh, I was fourteen years old. I went home to my mother, mm -hmm. and she said. What a big girl like you, not going to school. So she sent me to Modern Educational Institute. <laughs> I went for 18 months and I get college receptors. CP. CP. And then they say you're too old to go to school. You yeah. know what? So, so mm. you, end up, you ended up then staying at home looking after your younger sisters? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so what, when you came to England, you said you came to England when you were in your thirties, mid thirties? Well, I went back to my father's house. Okay. And my stepmother didn't want me, so he had to find somewhere for me to go. So mm -hmm. I went and stayed with my great, my grandmother's sister, who was living in King Street and she had a shop. And I got a job at Fogarty's. Okay. And I was working in the pen and the stationery department. And I've been there for like little under two years. And I got pregnant. I was raped and I got pregnant. And then when they found out, they sacked me because I was unmarried. Oh, oh gosh! Oh dear! Wow, that's that's really hard. Mm -hmm. So, so what 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 did you do then? You you had to go and where did you live then? Then there was the hard times mm, because be June. I was Chinese. Mm -hmm. Nobody want me. Mother want me, father want me because I'm pregnant, I'm bad. They didn't ask me nothing. I didn't even know I was pregnant, to tell you the honest truth. And uh, I knock around here, there, everywhere, sleep rough, sleep there, all kinds of things. And then my uncle took me in. But um, Auntie Joan, can I ask you, because you are an amazing cook, <laughs> and I just wanted to know where, along the way, I know it sounds like you moved around a lot, but did you learn, who was it that taught you to cook, or did, were you self-taught, or how did it? I, I went, after i have been going here and sleeping here and this and that, I went to work with a lady. And she taught me how to cook. A Chinese lady. Was she a friend of the of, of your parents or your grandparents? No, I didn't know her. So, sometimes when I was walking on the street, I used to see a whole Chinese lady and I used to call her auntie. Okay. You know, you call as respect. Mm. And one day she said, what are you doing down here? I said, I don't have any. I'm looking for somewhere to live. She said, come, come. I'm going to take you. Come. I had a child by then. Mm. And she took me in. She said, I have a room, but it's full of papers and I have to clean it out. So I went and I cleaned up the room. It had tons and tons of old newspaper. Mm. And it was a wooden bed, and I kept some, and then I, I use it as a mattress. Mm. It didn't have a mattress; it had newspaper. And she had an old mother, and I cared her. Yeah. Okay. The old mother used to they could, she was frail herself, mm. and I helped to clean clean that old lady and wash her sheet every day and change her. And then her niece saw me and the niece gave me a job. You used to give 
$5 a week. And he used to go and clean our house and she taught me how to cook. Wow. And so how did you then, did you save up money in order to pay for your, your, your fare to come to England? Oh, by then was another story. Oh, it was a whole other story. <laughs> I, was rich, I was rich then. You were rich? I like that. I'm happy to hear that. Then. I'm happy to hear that. I just want to come back quickly to Carly because I, I can see time's pressing and I, and I don't want to take up too much more of your time. Um, Carleen, I wanted you to talk a little bit more um, about the comfort because I just thought that was really fascinating. Um, was, was comfort something that was, was quite common in the black community or was it particular parts of the black um, community? Yes, um, different villages, sort of the, like the villages of farm, the villages of um, Denam still, certain black villages. Um, I don't, I'm not so sure about the East Coast, what happens, but I'm sure the East Coast villages, some of them probably had the same thing. But remember you think talking about when I was like the age of 10 or something like that. So, right. I mean, I didn't travel that much. It was a treat to go to Georgetown. Right. You know, I would get as far as like Tushun or Virgin Nujun or Iflok where I, where, where, where I lived for a little while. Most of my dwellings in it was Minkton Farm, Parika, and along that 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 coast, the coast there. The, so the comf yeah. so comfort dance. It was a tradition. The old African people yes. um, carried it, carried carried on it a lot. Yeah. For there were certain men and women, elderly men and yeah. women in the village. Like they go from villages and. Um, village to, vi to village that they know and they um, carry on this like um, this dance routine. Okay, so there were people who were like the elders that carried yes. on the tradition and yes, taught yes, other people. Yes, 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 but, okay. um, but alas, um, I didn't stay around in Ghana long enough to um, to find out the ins and outs of it because I, I'm still fascinated about it. Yeah. If I can intercept here, it was, as you said, really, I recall it was, you had the Jordanites and these people were dressed in white and they would sing on Saturday morning. But when they have these sort of like, there are special times when they will meet at various points in the villages because I was, and there was this band called Little Jones and Little Jones would always be at these comfort ceremonies. Mm -hmm. um, I recall this lady called Auntie Rini, and every maybe once or twice a month she'll, she'll come yeah. and they have they they have this table laid out with all mm -hmm. the food and whatever. But when the drums, as you said, they start singing the hymns and whatever, but going around and singing in, in a ring form. But when Little Jones, once you see Little Jones and that drum starts kicking. Trust me, you, it's like whatever is spiritually sticking up there. If you're not strong, you can easily be caught into it because mm -hmm. people outside would suddenly flounce, it's gone, like bang, their head's gone. Mm -hmm. I know some guys used to fake it in my school days. The guys would go there and because they wanted, because all the good foods are there and they want to get the taste of this food, so they just start pretending like they get the thing. And once you get it, they open the gate and you come inside and they would burst an egg on your head or whatever. They also burst an egg on you and then you get the other glass of water. There's always clear water as well. It's very spiritual. Not cutting you, Carl. That's a different thing from the actual um, African comfort dance. What you're talking about, that's more like spiritualism. Mm -hmm. Very Jordanite. Jordanite, Jordanite with the spiritualism. Are but yeah. the, They're but almost the like actual... Rastafari, but slightly. But the actual comfort dance is an African, old African tradition. Mm. Yeah, but, but the Jordanites have a church in Princess and John Street, a mm. whole big building mm. every Friday. Mm. Okay. So That's opposite in Stephen's line. school. But um, so Carleen, can you just describe what the scene would look like? I mean, did people wear particular outfits or? Yes, they like, tie their hair. Wear? African African outfit, African dress, African wear, they'll tie their head. It's now, I mean, because we are here, but as a child, you would think it's strange, but now, you know, you see how the African would wrap their head here. Yeah. Is that the same way they would wrap their head and they would wear certain colors. Yeah. 
right. and things like that. I can remember when Ghana, as a child, when Ghana got independence, I can remember mm, probably I was about five or something like that, mm -hmm. being taken around in African outfit, right? It was mm -hmm. made for me and I was on my dad's shoulder. This was in Iflock village and they would dance and the African drums and so it's a similar so, sort of things, all the Ghana colors. That's, so that's interesting because people must have been very, um, it must have been a very uplifting thing to see one of the African countries, Ghana, the first. Ghana, to become yes. Independence. Independence. Yeah. I remember that um, very clearly being, being taken and the village of um, Iflot, they cooked food because a lot of these, um, well, to me then, there were elderly people of course, associated, some of them associate very much still with Africa and the, the traditions and things like that. So hence you see the con that, the, in that particular scene, it was a conga dance because it's a happy occasion. So there's no um, of the spiritual element. It was happy and people dressed up and dance and cook African food like the kuku and the fufu and the okra soup and all those <laughs> kind of things. And that's my favorite food. What, kuku? No, mm -hmm. okra. Okra, yes, the okra, the okra, the okra, oh, the the and the metem, okay. all those things. It could be the, the, the you know hard food we call it yeah. here, but that was more the African tradition. That's the sort of that's the sort of thing they cooked, you know, at, at these um, um, yeah, ceremonies. Yeah. And as I said, they usually have like on Monday, the, the Monday holiday, which was the Emancipation Day sort of thing. Well, now they call it that. That's when. As a child in Iflock, they had like they call banquet. You buy, you buy a ticket. They have these sellers of ice cream and things like that. And you buy a ticket from a particular lady and you go to her to get your ice cream on yeah. the day. And it's like, a, it's a village thing. Right. Mm. You know, so, um, so what memories were the, of- What were the typical desserts then that, that they would have? I mean, I, I always remember the, um, it's like cassava bread, but with the- uh, Quint. With with with, with, a red, with the red coconut inside. Yeah, pine tarts. Pinches. Pinches. Yes. Pinches. Mm. Pinches. Pinches. And pine tarts. And pine tarts, yeah. Yes, pine tarts. Yeah, uh, Auntie Joan, you know how to make quinches? Not Gosh. really. <laughs> it's with a well, cassava bread, isn't it? It's like cassava bread. bread. Did, 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 did you not do any of that in Pomeroon? Me? No. We just bought no? it in charity. No, Oh, no, 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 no. You see, I can see a picture of the fireside. Now, a fireside like that, you get, you get your, I mean, that was part of my growing up, grating cassava, grating the bit of cassava, squeezing it, get yeah. the- I didn't um, do that. I was a tongue girl. And um, you make the starch from the cassava, you pour uh -huh. the water out, but you got to be careful and throw it in, not throw it, you mostly have to put it in the toilet or something like that, because if you leave it anywhere in a cow or anything, animals get it, it's, it's, they will die. Yeah. They will die. And then you, 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 you know. yes, you use the matter pee to squeeze the juices out of the, uh, out of the um, cassava. So did the, did, the Africans, did the Africans adopt the um, Amerindian way of... of yes, we can, yes, that is what I, I learned as a girl, how to make the cassava bread, how to make the quinches, how to make the kazri, yeah. and all these kind of things I did as a youngster. Mm -hmm. So I had a full, when I came to England, my, I had a full um, culture of Guyana. So yeah. to come here, did yes, I came up? as a teenager. Sorry. Conkeys as well, conkeys. Conkeys, yes, made the conkey, made conkeys. So everything cultural mm. I was taught to do in there. And the black pudding, the sweet bread, um, break mouth is another one that you Solara. Used. I was, Solara, I was taught all these things um, before I came here. So I had a um, butter flop and all those kind of things, you know, you, yeah. you make. So I had a. Um, I so mean, Rod, I had... Rod and I are looking forward to our invite then. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> but you know, butterfly, you have to be on site to eat it when it's hot. It's not. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you have to be bath and the sugar cake. Yeah. And I said mitai. I made mm -hmm. mitai and all these yeah. kind of things. I mean, I did even the. the... So I had a very um, good knowledge of all the cultural yeah. foods, what to do. So coming here. I only enhanced it by come, becoming a chef, trained yeah. as a chef. So I could do all the other different the English things, you see, making black cake and all that sort of thing. All that thing I was taught back home. Yeah. 
Wow. And uh, Aunt Joan, what were the typical foods that you used to cook when you were in uh, Guyana? Cook up. My favorite is a cook up rice with my stuff picked in. Oh dear! <laughs> I know. I love cook up rice with big tails. <laughs> if it don't have Carl, you you made one, one this weekend, rice. didn't you? I yeah. had cook up, but before I, Carlene, I wanted to ask. Apart from the quinches, they had one that I I like more because they do the same way they do the quinches, but they use salted fish. They put mm -hmm. salted fish on that one. Yes, it, yes. Name for it. Um, I can't quite remember, but I know you do it exactly mm -hmm. like the quinches, but you put salt you fish, salt in, fish, in, fish yes. inside, in, inside. Yes. Yeah, and yes. eat it hot. You eat it. You eat it hot. You eat that one hot. The days when when grandmother would make cassava bread, as yes. you as you know, there's no cooking happening because it's from mm -hmm. cassava bread and putting on on the zinc top to dry, and from cassava bread you move on to making casri. When you come home from school, you had cassava bread and sugar water. That oh, was your yes. lunch. And yes. you went back mm -hmm. to school. Try giving the kids that today. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so okay. it's 5.30. So we got, we got, we got I think we have to we have to have another day of we, this. We need another day, but um I I, I have one last question. Um I wanna know what so one thing that puzzled me when I was in the Pomeroon was uh, Rod's aunt got Nara and mm -hmm. she went oh, yes. see, oh, she yes. went to see a man who mm -hmm. had got uh, and he, and he out of the pointer broom and uh -huh. then he was lining up on yes. her desk yes. the the bee, yes. Yes. and he got Nari. the string and he was checking various measurements yes. and yes. then he started praying over her and all this kind of thing and then she and had her glass Yes, but you put it. You light. You, you got put a the glass on her belly. No, you have to put. You get a little um, like cloth, and you put some rice inside, uh -huh. and you tie it. The person lies on their back, and it is placed on the belly button. Right. And yeah, then, you and you light it, and as soon as you light it, you put a glass and you cup it, and you would see when it would pull together, and the, and the, the fire, the light would go out. It pulls the person's intestines back together. That is narrow. It's, it's like um, your intestines all tangled up. That's basically what narrow is. But I, I just, I, it baffles me because I have never come a, a, across any other territory where people talk about tangled up intestines. <laughs> but they call it here parentonitis, and so they give it fancy names, but the same, that's it's why the same if you have thing. Nara, in Guyana, they will say, don't try, don't take the person to hospital for them to cut them. Okay. And then I learned that in school early, early. The early Indians. Days. What were you yeah. saying, Auntie Jo? The Indian, they, they, it was the Indian man who used to come and do that. Yeah, that is yeah. the guy who knows how to do that. Or an old midwife. Yeah. Okay. So, so, I, mean, so I learned that from so you her. you would get rice, put it in a bag, tie a string. No, no, no. Not a no. big bag. It's oh. a small it's a little, little piece of cloth. A little piece of cloth. And you put uh. the rice inside and you tie the bag just a little bit. Uh -huh. And you put place it on the person's belly button. Okay. And then, but before you do that, you'll soak it in a little um, olive oil or, or well, coconut oil then. Coconut oil. Uh -huh. So uh -huh. as when you light it, it would light. And uh -huh. then you get a clear glass, like what Carl's okay. drinking out of there. And, yes. you, <laughs> and then you cup it onto the, you put it onto the, per, over the person's belly button. Yeah. And you would see slowly, slowly the light would go out. And you could see the person, if you look closely, you uh -huh. will see the person's, the, the tummy is drawing in and the light would go out. Okay. They're called and have any, uh, 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 any of the three of you, have you had Nara and has this procedure? Yes, worked? I've had. I've had. I saw it. It's a strain of yourself. It's a strain yourself. Okay. If you strain yourself, you get Nara, you get intense. It's very oh. painful and in your intestines yeah. kind of like um, get all tangled up. So to just straighten it out. Nara. So if you had something like a headache, what, what would your mothers have given you or your grandmothers have given you? Well, she will tie your head with, and put good. lima call on it. Lima call, sap it with lima call or bay rum or something like or that. Or methylated spirits. Or methylated spirits, yes, anything like that. And you tie a cloth and she would sap it and she'd put you to lie down. Oh, wow. <laughs> 
Well, kids, we very rarely get headaches. If you get a yeah, headache, it's, it's like it's something, something you're really ill. Something is otherwise is wrong yeah. with you. As a child, Not I didn't get headache. Sorry? I didn't get headache. I no, you didn't get a headache as a child. No, you're too busy oh. climbing a tree and all these other yeah. things. You need yeah. that time for a headache. Okay. <laughs> no, right. I had chores. Sorry? I had chores. I mean, okay, as you grow up, you had chores, you know, clean no, the yard and that sort of thing. No, when I was a child and I come in from school, mm -hmm. I had to water the plant. Oh, you had yes. to carry wood yeah. upstairs. Stay. Oh, yes. You had yeah. to get water upstairs. Yep. Yep. Chickens to feed. Oh, yeah. yes, all of that. <laughs> I had chores. As soon as I get in, I had to ensure the drums were filled. I had to go and, when in the country, go to fetch, fill up the drums. I had two drums to fill up. And you mm -hmm. have to get it before the pipes get crowded. And then you mm -hmm. go feed the chickens. Then you have to go and cut the wood mm -hmm. um, to make fire, to fire wood for the night. This is in the town there. Well, that's oh, the but you see, I was a country girl. I had like a bit of country. Girl, so I, had a girl. I, country, country. I had to get up at four o'clock in the morning to cook I was a lunch four. to take to school with you. Oh. But I had to walk a mile and a half to have to go and get milk, buy milk way mm -hmm. down, but two miles no, we, to get back. No, the milkman came along with his with his uh, well, so the car. Oh, okay. You just had to step but, outside and get it. Well, you you are all tongue girls in country. We had a farm and we I had cows and sheep. So milk. I didn't I didn't have to go and buy milk. You just yeah. go and put your hands. What about penus? Any of you girl ladies remember penus? No. No. What's that? Now, penis was something was that was made, say, when the cow just, as they said, dropped in those days, uh -huh. cows has a calf, like a mm -hmm. couple of days after, that milk, when you boil it, it more than likely sometimes it would turn. Or we as children, when we were naughty, we squeeze a lime inside. So the milk would turn. Yeah. Oh, and you get curled. And, and you put, you had sugar, you had sugar to it and let it boil down. Lovely. Uh, is it called pera? Is it called pera? We call it crunchy. Crunchy? Well, no. We call it pera. No, we call it um, maybe same thing, but different names depending on yeah. what village yeah. you got, village did you come you, from. Uh, what ha did you did um did you got a favorite chiggers if you walk barefoot you get a chigger? Oh, oh yeah. and yeah. and grung itch yeah. and grung itch yeah. between your toes, yeah. yeah. grung itch. And you had and you had to get do to get and and sometimes you got sometimes you got a crack, a crack or thing, and then you had to rub it with salt grease. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Or or you get a green plant in skin, hot it in the fire, and you put it between if you had grung it, you put it between the toe as hot yeah. as you can bear it, and that cures it. it out. Yeah. yeah. But it's oh, also yeah. And, and, it, and sometimes you'll get a ringworm. Well, that is a no, that ring worn is a penny stone. Yeah, yeah, you put a penny, put a penny on top of the penny on it. Yeah, yeah. yeah, you rub it with a cup. You see where this conversation is going now. Yeah. I'm going to I'm going to just stop it there for a moment and say I want to say thank you to all of the speakers. Thank I'm going to switch off the record and then we can all just have a free for all. <laughs> um, but let's just thank everyone first of all. So I just want to say thank you so much, Carleen. Thank you, Joan. Thank you, Carl. And thank, thank you, you very much, Ruthie. Really, really appreciate thank it. You. And I'm sure everybody listening, um, it's, you. I mean, we've gone on like two and a half hours. Wow. Um, we can go on a lot longer. <laughs> True, you, Nate, Benita, Ruthie, I would very much like to have one of your book. And if I you could you just put your address in the message. Uh-huh. And we can, and, and I'll pass it on to Ruthie. Yeah. Okay. So most kind. Fine. Thank you very so much. And uh, I just, I just now, now my put, I put my um, other filter, filter off. I can actually show you uh, the other book. Uh, uh, here it is. I don't know if you can see it. Can you see? Let's it? see. Yes. I can, a, a little decide. Uh, the African Prince. African of Prince Battersea. of Battersea. Yes. And uh, this is this is based on. Uh, a lot of people from, from Guyana came over, uh, all, the, all the Caribbean, they came over and they met Africans for the first time. And yes. they thought, oh, you're black, we're black, let's get together. Yeah. But they didn't realize the, 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 the huge gulf between um, what an African had grown up doing and what a Caribbean had grown up doing. Mm -hmm. And especially that slavery. Oh, gosh, yeah. But also the fact that many people in Africa 
actually were part of the slave trade. And, yes. and so they were actually marrying the ones that actually sold them. Oh. So, um, and that, that was him. That was him. Oh dear. Uh, oh, my mother won. <laughs> the other book? This is, this is a little book uh, that I, it's kind of, I was working in agriculture. Mm -hmm. It was uh, ag agriculture, you'll, you, you see the price of food these days. And mm -hmm. back in the days we used to have chickens, we used to grow our own vegetables, we used to do all kinds of stuff. And people stop doing that now. Mm -hmm. They think agriculture, <clears throat> agriculture is very, very glamorous. This one, I, I've re redone it. And these are little weary, weary peppers. And they're, they're, the they're, they're all the shades of, of Guyana. Mm -hmm. And they're going off to the Commonwealth Games. It's, I'll just show you the pictures because it's probably easier to understand. This is Guyana. They've, they've got a Commonwealth Games. This is, a, this is the family of the Caspian. And uh, these are the Indians saying, oh, we're going to send some people. We don't have money to send people to the games, but we'll send, we'll send uh, the Caspians. And this is Fabric. And in the end, they won the prize. Oh, dear. Very good. So that's that's basically just to get people in, interested in ag agriculture. Um, can, are these are these all available on Amazon, or where do they get people get them? Um, uh, the African Prince is available on Amazon. This is available on Amazon, and um, these are some pictures of of the family that this is. They're all this one's illustrated quite nicely, and you see people going off to America and buying a TV TV set. Aww. Uh, and coming back with a TV and showing everybody the t in the village that, oh, we've got a TV now. I don't know if um, George is still there. Um, Uncle I George, George um, you can unmute yourself if you want to say anything. But this is this is him. Are you okay? In the in the U.S. Army, mm -hmm. because when he went when he went to um, America, he got drafted, mm -hmm. and he had to go into a submarine and, and fight. Oh no. In Vietnam. So oh, dear. Honorable discharge for that. It's my mother going to to um, Buckingham Palace. Uh-huh. And she got a, her award. What book is this one? This is the same, this is the book I was telling you about. Okay, right. Mm -hmm. And this is my mother getting a prize and everybody right. knows. Yes, yes. So it was, it was, I mean, I we've all got masses of history. We must record it. We must remember it. Um, the soldiers coming, the Scottish soldiers getting off the boat, coming to fight for the British flag. Is that 1970 something, 1960 something? 1960 something, yes. Yeah, I remember that, yes. 1966. 66, yes. In 1966. Yeah. And that's her getting a, her award. Ah, yeah. lovely. And someone was talking about handicraft. This is my grandmother's handicraft. Um, um, embroidery? Embroidery. Embra embroidery. Hand embroidery. Hand embroidery. And that's about it. So it, it's very important that we, we are aware of all the things that they've done, all the things that you've done. Mm -hmm. And let's build on that and see what we can do. Yeah, yeah, couldn't agree yeah. more. I mean, just, just, just listening to the three of you. Look how many stories, and we haven't even scratched the. <laughs> we haven't, haven't even scratched, scratched the surface. The surface. <laughs> Still got a lot more to talk about. Honestly, lots, lots more. The we'll, we'll days of to, Mackenzie. We'll have to do some more nostalgia, but um. Radio yeah. alone is one subject. I know. I know. Exactly. Gosh, yeah. Oh, the radio. Um, but you know what? The radio used to have people in a, in addition to the um. The death thing. It used to be, be Bordet, but what is it? Bordet request. Bordet request with with with, with, with uh, the low seal. seal. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's the early days. Yeah, but yeah, it, it in the early on. early days. Yeah. You Chomley. E yes, yeah, everybody used to listen to Bordet request. Oh yeah, yeah. 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 hearing your name on the radio is a big thing. That's right. Yes, yeah, Bordet request. Like, yeah. Wow. But then who I was know. the one that used to have people singing one day at a time, Lord, one day at a time? Oh, that was the, I think it was quarter to seven in the morning. Yeah. Everybody in the morning, everybody yes, singing one day at a time, four thing in the morning. Tune, quarter to seven. Hold your thoughts there for, for, for a moment, everyone. I just want to remind you that we've got, um, I've, put a, I've put a link in right at the top of this chat um about the Roy Heath event on the 24th of April so if you want to book your tickets now you can I haven't finished organizing the event so the
the Eventbrite link doesn't have any details in it, but just so that you've got the um, a reminder that will come to you if you want to book it. Um, but I'm just going to switch the recording off now and just extend my thanks to all four of you. You've been amazing. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you. you all. Thank Pleasure. you all. Thank you all very much.